Broadcasting from their world headquarters in Texas, it's the Arcade Repair Tips Live Show. The show that discusses arcade repair, restoration, news, and more. Now, here are your hosts, Tim and Jonathan. Hello everybody and welcome to episode 63 of the Arcade Repair Tips live show for May 2022. My name is Jonathan Leung. I'm the producer, director, and editor of the Arcade Repair Tips video series. And joining me today, as always, is Mr. Arcade Repair Tips himself, Tim Pearson. Tim, how you doing? Well, I'm glad we got electricity for right now. If uh, We might have to duck and hit the storm shelter sometime during this po- program, but maybe it's all came through our area, I hope. I think we're good right now. We did have some <coughs> storms come through earlier today, guys, and our internet is not always the best here, mm-hmm. along with electricity. Uh, for the most part, we stay up, so hopefully we'll stay up throughout the show tonight. We won't have inter- any interruptions, but if we do, Tim, we do record the show, so we mm-hmm. will post it at a later time. Um, unfortunately, that would mean we wouldn't have the interaction with mm-hmm. the live chat, right. but you guys would understand, of course. But anyway... How are y'all doing? Good to see everybody. We've got a lot, Tim, in the live chat already tonight. Uh, Matt E is here. Silly Sausage 72 is here. Encore's Arcade is here. Uh, Joe Flores is here. Real Hammer Billy Lee is here, Tim. Uh, Geek Light 08 is here. And of course, we've got YouTube Punk as well. Thank you guys all for joining us tonight. We're hoping that we'll have a great show. I've seen the I've seen the outline, Tim. I think it's pretty decent. Yeah, I think but, so. But uh, we'll see as we continue on. So before we begin, Tim. How are things going on your side? Obviously, you've been dealing with the weather today, I know. Yeah, um, yeah, it's just been kind of a crazy day all over East Texas. Tornadoes dropping down and lots of hard rain. And not a good day to have to travel and drive a lot. But I survived and everything's good. Um, last time we were here, John, I meant, meaning to ask you, you were building a gun. I did. <laughs> and we shot some. Yeah, the Easter egg guns. We right. did. How did those come out? They came out really good. I can talk about those in the after show, maybe. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah, we um, some Easter egg launching guns, Tim. I do think, like, maybe a five-year-old got hit in the back of the head with an egg, unfortunately. That may have been the only casualty, though. I think everybody <laughs> else survived the uh, the great Easter egg gun uh, blast of, what, Ot-22? Is okay. that what it would be? So, anyway. But, uh, yeah, we had fun building those, Tim. Obviously, a side project, but uh, good fun there. So I do want to remind you guys that are in the live chat that you can interact with us during the show by leaving your comments, questions, suggestions, anything else that you have in the live chat room. And Tim, we have a couple in there already, so I'm going to go ahead and go to that. Matt E. says, have you guys considered making a digitally available version of your DVDs? Something like, uh, let's see, Think Thinkific or Gumroad or Udemy courses. We've actually looked at Udemy and some other things in the past. Uh, about doing something like that, Tim. Mm-hmm. But just, I don't know, we never felt like it would be popular enough to get the traction. If enough of you guys would sign up, if we did like a digital course of some sort, then we would probably do it. So if you are interested, uh, send us an email at questions yeah. at arcaderepairtips.com and let us know your interest level. If we get enough people, if we could get enough people to sign up, Tim, we would do it, right? Sure. So there you go. Silly Sausage 72 says, Greetings from California. Uh, Encore's Arcade says, hello everyone, happy Cinco de Mayo. It is Cinco de Mayo, right. so hopefully you've got your Mexican food in front of you, Tim, and you've got <clears> your, uh, you know, your choice of uh, alcoholic beverage. <laughs> if you do that, that's up to you, but, uh, I know, you know, a lot of people celebrate Cinco de Mayo that way, so if you're doing that, more power to you. Tim, it is also Revenge of the Fifth. That's right. <laughs> so, of course, we had May the Fourth be with you yesterday. Correct. So, for those of you guys who are... Who are obviously Star Wars fans out there? It's it's a good time of year, Tim. And yeah. yesterday we did post a deal about the Star Wars Arcade One a pinball machine. Those went pretty quick, so hopefully yeah. you guys saw that and were able to get one for the four hundred and twenty dollar price, which Tim is one of the cheaper prices I've seen on those Arcade One Up pinball. Yeah, tables. I was really shocked to see that that price. Yeah, so I haven't seen them less than that very often. So hopefully you guys scored that. Uh, let's see. Joe Flores says, Joe Tech in the house. Woohoo. Uh, Real Hammer Billy Lee says, hello, hello. Happy Revenge of the Fifth. So there's mm-hmm. another one, Tim. Uh, let's see. John Freddy Moreno says, uh, sal- uh, saludos uh, de, uh, desde Colombia. Okay. So I guess greetings from Colombia, Tim. All so right. you, that's the cool thing, guys, about doing the show is you're from all over the place. We talk to people, of course, here at where we are in the United States, but we also talk to people in Australia or England or Colombia, all over the place. So we always want to, we also want to thank you guys who are international for watching because Tim, it may not be the most convenient time for you, <laughs> right? <laughs> as it is for a Probably lot of people really here in right the States. Probably really late there in Colombia. Absolutely. Matter of fact, uh, Geeklag08 says hello, everybody. YouTube Punk says <laughs> let's go. Let's see. Um, we got Doker, uh, let's see if I can say that, Doke Tor, Torzet says, hey guys. Uh, YouTube Punk says the existence of the real Hammer Billy Lee suggests the existence of a fake Hammer Billy Lee. So that's always <laughs> right. good. Uh, Carlos <laughs> says, hello everyone. And uh, there you go. I think we're caught up. Okay. 
So again, if you guys want to leave anything, make sure you leave it in the live chat and we will try to get to that whenever we have time. We're kind of going, we usually weave that into the questions. Sure. I, w I was going to say insert, but I like the word weave. I think so. So there you go. So, oh, we got greetings from Germany, Tim. Okay. So there you go. All over the place. We love it. So well, thank you guys for joining us. I got to ask what part of Germany. There you go. You know, since I've been to Cologne and uh, have friends in Cologne. There you go. Dusseldorf. Same. Anyway, so just Germany right now. We'll I'll let back. you know. I'll let you know if they they chime back in. So, I've been Tim. <laughs> <laughs> so Tim, before we get into the questions, though, I do want to show this. This may uh, make you feel old. I know it does for uh -oh. me. But uh, we're celebrating our 14th anniversary this month. It's crazy. In fact, here in a couple of days, Arcade Repair Tips was founded on May 8, 2008. Tim, the first post was the parts of an arcade cabinet, which is still up, and you can still find on our website. And we do want to thank. Everyone who has read, watched, listened, or con contributed to our content these past 14 years, we greatly appreciate it. And Tim, we say this all the time, mm -hmm. uh, every time we have an anniversary, but uh, you guys are the reason we continue to do what we do. We would not have been going for 14 years if it wasn't for all you guys who read and watch and, and listen to the content that we provide. So we want to thank you guys, of course. But Tim, it's hard to believe we've been doing it for 14 years now. Wow. Oh. It doesn't seem like it. There you go. So it must uh, have started when I when you were uh, ten and I was twenty, right? You know, I went went too far <laughs> off. I don't think so there you go. But fourteen years, guys. <laughs> market repair tips will coming up here in like three days. So, uh, just uh, like I said, thank you guys for uh, for continuing to watch and listen and read our content. We do appreciate you guys uh, more than you know. So. Okay, Tim, enough of it. Did I get the, like, sentimental stuff out of the yeah. way? Is Let's that enough of get that? get to the question. Okay, there we go. No, we got uh, two from Chicago, Tim. Okay. I should say that, two from Chicago. Oh, Hanover, Germany. Okay. So there you go. And that's uh, Dok Torzet. Dok Torzet. Okay. So there you go. Okay. So we're caught up, so let's go ahead and move into our questions for this evening, guys. And the first one we have here is from Chris. So I'm going to put Chris's up here. My left joystick stopped working. Now, Tim, uh, I kind of talked with Chris a little bit more. His mm -hmm. left direction on okay. his joystick is not working. The trackball works. The wire tests fine to board. The switch is good. I bypass the switch. Still gives no left movement. So what's bad? So, Tim, we've got a... It sounds like Chris probably has just a, a regular, maybe four-way joystick with mm -hmm. like a 60 and one And his left direction, whenever he hits it, is just not registering at all, okay? And so he says he's checked the... It says a wire test to the board. So right. he's done continuity back to the board, which is something we would suggest. He says that's good. The switch is good. Right. Okay, so what else could be going on with Chris's arcade game here that would cause it not to register the left direction? Well, he mentioned that he checked the wire from the switch to the board, but you have two wires that go to each switch. It takes two to tango with a switch. And so um, he did mention that he, he probably checked the main wire or directional wire but not the ground wire. And that's where we usually see the problem is there's a break in the ground. So the black wire or the one that's in the ground position uh, could probably possibly be his problem. If your switch is good and uh, unless, on a rare occasion, it could be a board issue, but super rare, more than likely it's the ground uh, wire. So it takes two. In other words, that complete the circuit, you need that ground wire. So I'm assuming that it's probably the ground wire. Okay, well, Tim, I actually heard back from Chris okay. and kind of replied the same thing that you mentioned here. And he said what actually happened was that apparently the pin for that direction on his board was dirty. Okay. So he took an eraser to it and cleaned it off. And then once he put the harness back on, beautiful connection. Okay. So, well. I mean, that happens too. So those edge connectors, guys, <clears throat> like especially when we think of JAMA boards, okay, or any kind of board that has an actual edge connector, uh, those get dirty, right, Tim? Right. So even though he was getting continuity on the wire, the wire wasn't making connection with the board on the edge connector. You got it. Okay. Exactly. Well, that and makes so, sense. And so what you can do is you can take just like a regular pink pencil eraser or mm -hmm. anything and just kind of go along those pins, correct? Yes. It's very good. They, they just get oxidized over time and quit making a good connection. And a lot of times, especially, uh, he didn't say what game, but a lot of times, uh, especially on old Pac-Man board and stuff like that where a lot of heat um, takes place, uh, you'll see that. There you go. So I'm going to go ahead and throw Chris's slide up here, Tim. And uh, basically, like you mentioned in your question, you did not mention if you check the ground wire going to the switch, make sure that the ground wire is connected to the correct position on the switch and that it's actually connected to a ground on the other end using the continuity check on your meter. Tim, we've seen this a lot 
where it's like all three of my directions will be working, but that last direction won't. And it's because mm-hmm. there is a break in that daisy chain that's causing the issue. Now, if the ground checks out, like Tim mentioned, it's possible that your board may may be the cause of the issue. You might try going into the test mode for your game board, see if it has an I.O. check, so you can test the switch there. You can also trace back from the input pin on the board for additional troubleshooting. And Tim, that last part is kind of the important part here, because that's really what Chris ended up doing. He mm-hmm. ended up going to the pin on the board and saying, wait a minute, I've got the harness connected, but I'm not getting continuity to that pin. And so he just had to clean it up with an eraser a little bit. As you can see the update, the pin on the board on the left joystick direction had to be cleaned with an eraser thanks and then once he did that good to go right you know most of the time when we're going to check continuity we'll we'll unplug the harness because we can get it good there but sometimes it's probably good to check it to where the pin actually comes through the board so you're going through the harness all the way uh to the switch so that might be something worth noting uh next time you go to check one if you're not getting continuity there uh, make sure that you are getting continuity from the harness to the board. Absolutely. That short span right there could be your problem. And like you mentioned, Tim, <clears throat> you can do that with the harness connected. So you could have the harness connected, and then usually there's enough of the pin there exposed, Tim, that you mm-hmm. can just put your your um, your little... Your meter uh, probe. Yeah, your probe. <laughs> thank you. Your probe right there, and then put it on the other end and check the continuity that way. So, uh, Chris, we're glad to hear that you got your, you got your game board in the left direction back up and running, and good luck with your future arcade projects. Okay, I'm going to check in. Uh, YouTube Punk says 14-year anniversary. There you go. Mm-hmm. He's giving us a little congratulations there. Real Hammer Billy Lee says fiberglass pins were great to clean edge, edge connectors. Have you ever used that, Tim? Uh, no, I haven't. That sounds good. Sounds sounds correct, though. Okay. Yeah, Dr. Z. Excuse me. Yeah, sorry. You know, when I'm pronouncing these names, guys, I'm just kind of looking at them. And unfortunately, Tim, the live chat on our screen has got, like, font this small. And I need it's to really, figure out... I, need I to, can't see it at all. I was about to say, I need to figure <laughs> out a way to increase that font. Unfortunately, you know, I've got my... Uh, you know, it is what it is. I've got my contacts in, so I can kind of see it well. But I really have to look at some of those. So, yes, doctors that... Sorry about that. So, that is that is the, the guy from Germany, Tim. Okay. I was talking about earlier. Nice so. to meet you. There we go. So, again, Tim, I think we're caught up with the live chat. So let us continue on in our outline here, Tim. And our next question is from The Creep. Okay. That's all <laughs> That's all he gave me. Okay? Okay. So okay. The Creep is what it is. I have a marquee light that I am wiring straight to a new power supply. There are three wires, black, white, and an almost off-white. Can you tell me where to wire them on the power supply? It's an original fluorescent light for an Atari Superbug. Thank you. Now, Tim, before we before we continue on with this, have you seen an Atari Superbug in a while? No, not in a long time. <laughs> I, was pretty, trying, I was trying to think of the last game. time I had an Atari, or I had seen an Atari Superbug, maybe like when we were at an arcade or something like that. Yeah. Uh, it's been a long time since I've seen one of these guys, but um, Tim, there, I mean, marquee lights are marquee lights, right? Right. So he's just trying to wire it up, and he's got this kind of black, this white, and this off-white, and he's just wondering, where do I need to wire these things? on my game in order to get this marquee light up and running. Well, your black is normally your hot wire and your white is a neutral, so I'm gonna assume the other one is ground. Uh, but usually ground wires can be black or they can be green. So I, I, I may be making it harder than it is. You've gotta know which where they're going. In right. other words, are they going straight to uh, the chassis uh, of the of the light or the fixture itself is it grant the which find which one's ground one of those wire find find the wire color that's going to a screw or a nut or something like that that one will be go to ground and then the other two it technically um, you know we say it doesn't matter it should work as long as you hook it up to the ACs on each one uh, but I know that there are lines hots and neutrals and it does somewhat matter so i would probably choose the darkest wire for the hot so maybe if that makes sense sure whatever's left if the black is a ground then the white is probably going to be neutral since you have a white wire right and tim a lot of times in these marquee lights there's a transformer up in there too and uh-huh. so you can see where the wires are going to the transformer if it's up in there um and just that may give you a hint as to where they are but tim i mean i looked at the manual Okay. Just to see if I could figure out what was going on. And so this is kind of some information from the manual. According to the Atari Superbug manual, the marquee light should use 110 volts AC for its input voltage. Tim, that's pretty standard. Right. right? So the manual also states that the wire colors for the marquee light should be black for line or hot, like you mentioned, mm-hmm. white for neutral, and green for ground. 
Like it literally says this intent. This uh, little clipping here to the side I is actually it. from the manual for Atari Superbug. Okay, okay. And, it, and you can see the wire colors there. You can see the bl the black, the green, the white. Like it literally has the black, green, and white there, and it should be that on both ends. So here's the thing, Tim. If if the creep still has the original wiring going up to the marquee light, he should see a black, a green, and a white. There you go. You know what I'm saying? So it should be there. And if the plugs are still there, it should plug in like that. I agree. So. Now, in most cases, the black and white wires usually match up to their correct AC wiring counterparts, Tim. That's what we found out. Right. And so, which leaves only the almost off-white, which we can probably assume is the ground. Based on this, you should be able to connect the wires to their respective locations on the new power supply. Now, again, if you want to double-check that, there should be a transformer or something up in the marquee light where you can see where each of those whites, each of those wires is heading. And so, usually, Tim, like the two going directly to the transformer prongs are going to mm -hmm. be your AC wires, okay? Correct. And so, the ground will be going somewhere, somewhere like to the frame of the marquee light to make sure that you don't have any kind of, you know, obviously, if there's some sort of spark or something like that, it's grounded. So, so that's what you need to look for probably more than anything is actually look at the marquee light and see where the wires are connected in the marquee light itself. And then, like I said, if there are two going to a transformer, those are going to be your AC. And the other one may be going to, like, the entire metal frame of the marquee light. In that case, it's probably the ground. There you so, go. Uh, Tim, anything else here for the creep before we move on? No, I think we... I, if, if any of that was... I mean, it seems pretty simple to me, but if, if you're not sure, if you want to take some pictures or whatever... Please email us back. We'll be glad to help you more if you need it. Absolutely, yeah. If you want to send some pictures to us, that's fine. The Creep. Uh, in fact, Tim, I don't like calling somebody The Creep. I'm going right. to call them Not The Creep. So, Not, <laughs> not The Creep, if you want to send us some pictures or something like that, you can do that uh, and send it over our way at questions at arcaderepairtips.com, and we can probably help you determine that a little bit more. But typically, whites and blacks, Tim, they match up on AC wiring. That has been a standard forever, right, Tim? Yes. So, I mean... That's what makes me think the off-color wire is probably as ground. Agreed. So, uh, hopefully, they answered your question. But if you do need a little bit more help, send us over another email, questions at arcaderepairtips.com. We'll try to help you out further there. Okay, Tim, uh, we got a question from John here. He says, what about using moss to clean contacts? Have you ever used moss to clean contacts? Yes. Okay. How's it For work? For sure. It works great. Yeah. Okay. It's very good, um, especially the edge connectors. It would be great. It's good stuff on that. Yeah. And if you guys don't know what Moss is, it's that metal cleaning solution that you mm -hmm. can get. Who makes it? I always forget. Um, I don't know. It's M-A-A-S. Yes. Is the how you spell it? I don't even remember who makes it. Right, you can get it. Uh, I mean, Amazon. They has used it to carry stores. at Walmart, but yeah. now the last time I bought some, I think it was off of Amazon. There you go. So it's very handy for cleaning uh, metal metal mm -hmm. parts, uh, and I mean even on edge connector pins, mm -hmm. it's really good as well. Never dull. You can get it at Walmart or at uh, AutoZone or Pet Boys or O'Reilly's, one of those, and it works good too. It's you know it's the kind in the little can that looks like cotton. You right. It already has a solution in it, and you can kind of rub that on there, and that will clean really good. It's made for car rims, right? Mostly, but it works great on that kind of stuff. Gotcha. Sounds good. Okay, Tim. Well, let us continue on with the outline, and the next question we have is from Matt. And Matt says, "I recently picked up an NFL Blitz '99 cab that has a MacVision chassis, which is really a Waya 3129D series. When booting from a cold start, the cabinet will be playing blind, and there's a steady clicking noise, two hertz or so." or so. Normally, I'd be thinking something is wrong with the hot, but when I was buying it, the previous owner says, said, and then demonstrated, that if you let it keep clicking for 30 to 60 seconds while it warms up, you can flip the power switch off, and the next time you flip it on, the cab would boot right up. Okay. Okay, sure enough, he's right. Mm -hmm. He's also said it's generally best, uh, for, uh, gener generally good for the rest of the night after that. The fact that the monitor works fine after the warm-up phase makes me think it isn't the hot that's bad. Uh, I haven't checked voltage, voltage levels yet, so I'll be starting there. Is it possible a capacitor that's not at the original level of energy storage, but also hasn't completely died yet? Is it possible that that could be the case? Perhaps while the machine is warming up, a capacitor is slowly charging, and then once we cross some threshold of farad of farads of energy, uh, there's enough energy to get the monitor chassis over the hump and actually fire up the next time we start the machine. Thoughts on my theory, other ideas. I'm looking forward to hearing <laughs> back from you. Tim, this is a very interesting yeah. <laughs> question. Now, uh, Tim, I know you're not a fan uh -huh. of the Mac Vision Wire chassis. Is. I know that this is something that uh, typically you try to avoid, but you've also seen a lot of them yes. because Chuck E. Cheese used to have a ton of these back in the day, correct? Yes. 
So, Plenty. Uh, so I also sent this over to Michael okay. to get his thoughts. But before we get his thoughts, Tim, why don't you give us your thoughts here on, on his problem? Uh, this is a very interesting problem from Matt here. So what do you think? So obviously, it sounds like the hot may be good. Right. Be, or at least functioning. Because we can get picture if we let this clicking go on for like 30 seconds, 60 seconds, turn off the machine, turn it back on. Um. And uh, I'm glad that you consulted Michael on this, but nine times out of ten when I've seen that, it's a filter cap. It's one of the little tiny caps right in the middle of your chassis. Um, but it, it is right that it could still be something with the hot causing it to kind of drain it, but more than likely it's a filter cap. That's my guess. Okay. Well, let me put Michael's uh, response back here, Tim, and you can give our, your thoughts on that. So response from Michael. This problem is very common. I have seen this with monitors as well as TVs. The bad news is it's sometimes hard to troubleshoot. The clicking sound is usually a symptom of high voltage shutdown. Now, Tim, we could probably could have guessed that because right. we know he's having power issues. Normally, I short it hot, right? right? That's very common with the clicking noise. But since this will work, that isn't the case here. I would look for the 100 microfarad cap near the power supply section first. The, um, then check any remaining caps in the power supply and then move to any electrolytic caps in the high voltage section. And the SR meter would definitely help in this case. I would also look for cold solder joint. It may not be bad enough where it's totally obvious. Since the chassis works after it warms up, solder will expand with any amount of heat and restrict when it gets cold again. Correct. Okay, so, so Michael's thing here is that we're probably, like you mentioned, Tim, probably looking for a bad cap in the power supply section. Um, and then, obviously, he mentions an ESR meter, Tim, which is basically a device that allows you to test caps. When in it, circuit. When, exactly, mm -hmm. in circuit, so you don't have to pull every cap out, which is, is really good. But he also mentions, Tim, something that Michael probably mentions every time I ever talk mm -hmm, to him, right? and that is touching up the solder all over it. And so what may be happening here, Matt, is that you, your hot may actually not be bad, but it may have a cold, cracked, or broken solder joint on it. And so what happens mm -hmm. is that when you first boot it up, that solder is cold, so that connection's not made. And then as it warms up, that solder expands just enough to connect the hot back to the chassis. Right. And at that point, it starts working again. So basically, anything in the high voltage section, you need to touch up the solder on. Okay. So go. any mm -hmm. parts that you have in there, you need to do. Now, Tim, here's the thing. You got the chassis out. You're doing all this uh, solder touch up. Why not nice. do a cap kit on top of what you're doing? It's just a good time to do it. I mean, that's what we, our rule is if we have to pull a chassis out and we haven't installed a cap kit on it in a while, guess what? It's getting a cap kit, right? Right. I mean, because that's, I mean, if you're pulling the chassis anyway, you might as well install the cap kit on there too. Uh, Tim, any any more thoughts here on Matt's problem before we move No, on? I don't think so. I think that uh, he'll find that it probably is exactly that, either a broken, a cold solder joint or a bad cap. It's probably right there in the middle of the of the chassis. Sounds good. So Matt here, like Tim mentioned, let's let's uh, pull out the chassis. Let's touch up some solder joints. Let's install that cap kit, see where that leaves us, and touch up solder. If you're touching up that solder, every part in the high voltage section, especially the hot, Tim, because again, yes. the clicking noise a lot of times is a bad hot issue. So if that solder is cracked around that hot, you need to touch up the solder on it. Should get you where you're going. If you need any additional help, please let us know. Oh, and I talked to Michael, Tim. Oh, good. He moved. That moves again. Yeah. So, where? I mean, he was living in Florida for a while. Right. Okay. And I don't think, I don't, I, 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 maybe I shouldn't say where he's moving to. I'll okay. just say he's moved again. Okay. It's further west. Okay. okay well, but of course, it had to be further west than Florida. <laughs> but it's further west. So, um, it's not here in Texas. So, oh. but uh, he, you know, they're in the process of moving to him. He says he still has things in boxes. He would have filmed a video, but literally he says they still have things in boxes. So okay. I don't, you know, that's fine. Um, but it was good to talk with him for a little bit. Tim sounds like they're doing really good. And, that's awesome. and uh, you know, but uh, you know, he said he got disenchanted with Florida, Tim. I don't know if I could. Yeah. Florida seems like a really nice place. I don't know. Mm. But my, but at the same time though, maybe not. You know, yeah, some, sometimes not. things there are a little wild, you know, you got, you got other things going on. So, um, where he moved to, Tim, I can say this is a little bit more tame than Florida for sure. Okay. <laughs> so there you go. But anyway, uh, we wish Michael the best and hopefully Tim, we can get him on here doing some of his videos, uh, explaining some of his, uh, his, um, you know, the advice that he gives us a little bit more than me just reading it. So, uh, Michael, we know you're watching. So what's going on? Mm -hmm. Good luck with the move. Unpacking boxes, all that kind of stuff. So, okay, Tim, I'm going back to the live chat here. Uh, let's see. John says, I have a good question for you guys. I have some old side art. What should I use if it doesn't stick well? Okay. That, that is a great question because, um, if you get something too tough, you, you know, it'll stick forever and good and you better have it 
tough what so this is a great question because if you use like a spray 90 or something it'll probably be too tough um but if, of course if it's, you don't want it ever to come off that's good stuff to use i would probably go with a cheaper believe it or not like elmer's spray glue or okay. something something that would definitely stick but if you ever needed to take it off wouldn't be so hard down the road gotcha so typically tim mentioned spray 90 that's 3m spray 90 that's what we mm -hmm. would use on laminate so right. if we're laminating a cabinet, that's typically what we use. And you could use that here, like Tim mentioned, mm -hmm. but I do think, like Tim, it would probably be too strong. Yeah. And so a spray Elmer's, you're thinking something like that. 3M makes a reduced adhesive. I okay. don't know what their reduced, you know, what their not so strong adhesive level is. Yeah, you need something that'll stick, but not bond permanently. Um, but then again, the more I think about it, even a roller kind, of, you know, just something that would go on, just you kind of need it to be not stuck or you can't move it or if you get a wrinkle in it you're you know you need it kind of how we do we'll un pull un unroll it no that's not good take it off put it back you know uh that's what but if you can get it right the first time um and if anybody wants to pipe in i we might ought to research this a little bit more i i would think though that you don't want something that's why i thought of elmer's it's good, but it won't bond permanently or like super glue or something. You know, you don't want to use something like that. Gotcha. Sounds good. Uh, let's see what else here we have. Tim, we have Mr. Silverball Mania. I use pencil erasers for edge connectors. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you can definitely use pencil erasers. Oh, I like just the, I mean, pencil erasers are good, but I usually use like an eraser, like a pink, you know, mm -hmm. pencil eraser, like just eraser eraser, not the end of a pencil. Um, but sometimes the end of the pencil is a little bit easier to maneuver. Mm -hmm. Just depends. Uh, let's see. Philbert says, I have a bank panic, which was made into a Superman, but I need a new control panel. Is there anyone you know that has one that would fit? Not sure. Uh, bank panic. I can't remember what style cabinet that is. We'd have to probably look that yeah, up. Yeah, I'd have to send me a picture or something. I'd have to Google search it. Right. Now, here's the deal, though. A lot of times with control panels, you can reconfigure them. So if you put a new control panel overlay, for instance, on that control panel and then just drill the holes you need, you can kind of uh, make that work a lot of times. But, Tim, we have seen several control panels that just look like Swiss cheese, and there's just no way that you're doing right. that really well. So if that's the case, uh, you may be able to take it to, like, a metal fabrication co company locally mm -hmm. to you and have them make another one just like it. It's going to be a little on the pricey side. But if you're looking to do a full restore on your cabinet, it would be worth it. Tim, For do you have sure. anything else uh, that you can think of? No, I was thinking exactly that, taking it to a metal shop. We had one custom made. Uh, we took them in a sample and said, make another one just like this. It was a little over $100, which I didn't think was too bad, considering that a new control panel cost you a couple hundred bucks, you know, even sure. if it was custom made. You can also check with people on the different arcade uh, forums, you know, uh, Arcade Museum slash KLOV, Tim, of course, arcade controls and some of those. They may have, somebody may have one just lying around, uh, just, you know, taking up space that they would send you for, uh, you know, just shipping and a little bit of, little bit of uh, little, uh, money. So, I mean, you might check there first before you go to the fabrication route. But if I was doing a full restore in a cabinet, I would probably take it to a metal fabricator and have them do it for me. So there you go. Uh, let's see. Uh, YouTube Punk says everywhere is more tame than Florida. <laughs> so I'm not giving away. I'm not giving away Michael's location. Okay. Apparently. I, so there you go. I can't say it's more out west, and it's definitely more tame than Florida. So it only leaves like uh, what 40 states. So I think we're, I think I'm good at concealing. There we go. But uh, if he gives me permission to share that information, I'll share it with you guys. But I don't want to do that without having talked to him. So, but anyway. Let's see what else. Regular Show says, if the side art doesn't stick, I usually buy new art because using adhesive spray-on art causes bubbles and it's hard to get perfect. That is true. Mm -hmm. um, using the spray-on stuff, guys. I will say this, though. Like, Spray 90, if you can get a pretty even slot, you know, a pretty even coating on it, or even with the Elmer's, if you can get it pretty even, you can avoid a lot of bubbles. And here's the thing. New, new old stock side art is so cool. Right. But that is the one thing that's usually wrong with it, is that the adhesive has just deteriorate, deteriorated over time. You know, Tim, I actually worry. Like, my company makes adhesives. Mm -hmm. I need to talk to some chemist about making us an there adhesive <laughs> just for that. It's like, look, I need an adhesive that makes side art stick when it doesn't stick anymore. <laughs> that's the adhesive I need, so... I don't know how much I'd have to pay a chemist. A new, we might be on a Shark Tank before long. <laughs> I think that's a very niche audience. <laughs> yeah, I, don't I, do think we're, I was about to say, I, our, um, our, our whole customer base may be like a thousand people. <laughs> we're, try, we're trying to explain to them why we need a million dollars. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> hey, but why all a thousand value? people are going to buy this and we're yeah. going to sell it for a hundred bucks a can. Or whatever why, do you, why do you value your company at three billion dollars? <laughs> 
<laughs> so there you go. I can talk to some chemists. I'm sure they would have some ideas. I'm curious. But uh, yeah, there that's you go. A, uh, that's why I said it's a great question. I've never really thought about yeah. it like that before. Let's see. Um... Let's see. Encore's Arcade says, never done art myself. Hairspray? I guess. I, I don't know. There. You know, who, or, or just, I would maybe even contact some of our people who make artwork and ask them what, a, you know, they they don't print it with sticker on it. Right. I mean, they use some kind of glue. That's true. Yeah. So, like, you know, whenever some, whenever somebody prints art, I don't know, they may buy it. Like, they may buy, buy it pretty adhesive. Yeah, I was about to say, 3M makes, like, an adhesive print, printable. And that may be sheet. something that you could do, too, is buy some trace around it and then you know that's double-sided right does that make sense yeah, so yeah like a double-sided stick to stick it to this side end of the game yeah side, to maybe cut like it really that. well yeah Golly, that'd be tough so it depends on the artwork and what it is yeah and artwork is expensive and regular show said this too yeah artwork is ex- expensive for sure so i mean and here's the thing like i said there's something cool about having new old stock on there mm-hmm. i mean to me i like that you know i like i like the fact that look this literally came from the same factory that the original side art came from you know there's something yeah. to be said about that so um, but again, it, you know, Elmer's I could see, but getting the bubbles out may be a little bit of a challenge there for sure. Um, I think I would probably experiment with some tests, something like a test something just to see if I could get it the way I want it before obviously putting the real stuff on there. So, mm-hmm. but I don't know. Uh, it, like I said, maybe uh-huh. I need to ask a chemist. So, okay, Tim, well, let us continue on. And our next question is from Joe. And so I'll put Joe up here. Hey guys, I've been an amateur arcade collector for about 20 years now. I recently came across my favorite game, Exidy's Venture. They were only selling the cabinet with the monitor, bezels, and control panel. The cabinet seems to be in good condition. It's being delivered to me next month. Unfortunately, it doesn't come with the PCB boards or any of the wiring. I'm trying to figure out what boards do I need. Is there an audio board? What does a Venture PCB look like? What kind of power supply do I need? So, Tim, uh, we're buying an empty cabinet here. Reminds okay. me of somebody else I know that bought an empty cabinet once. <laughs> yeah. But uh, we're buying an empty cabinet. We're trying to resurrect a um, an Exidy Venture, Tim. Now, you might notice our uh, title for this episode is Hunting Venture for Superbugs. So, we've already, had two, uh, we've already had two of those come up. That's the Superbug, mm-hmm. Tim, the Atari Superbug. And then this is the Venture one. Okay. The hunting one we'll get to here in a second. Okay. Right. So, uh, But, again, Hunting Venture for Superbugs this month, Tim. Okay. And so... <laughs> We have Joe. Oh, Joe has pictures too. And I forgot and the rest of the question here. So let me read that. Oh, wrong scene. There we go. I've never owned a game by Exidy, so I'm not familiar with it. I'm still searching the internet for as much information, pictures, and parts. Unfortunately, there is not a lot of information out there for Venture. I wanted to ask you if you know where I can find a PCB and a harness for this game. Any help is greatly appreciated. Thank you, Joe from Detroit. So if you're in the Detroit area and you have some Exidy Venture parts that you can hook Joe up with, we would highly uh, we would appreciate that, and I'm sure he would too. And Tim, here are the pictures of his Venture. Okay, mm-hmm. now he sent more than this, but I just wanted to put up the ones that I felt were relevant to what we were trying to ask. So he sent us uh, this front. You can see the control panel in the, the front side of the cabinet here. You can see the inside of the cabinet. It's pretty clean. Okay, and this board here, which is kind of an important board, which is why I put that up there. And Tim, you may not know what that board is. We'll get to that here in a second. But basically, Tim, we're trying to bring this, uh, we're trying to bring this venture back from the dead. We have an empty venture, so I can help him with what the board looks like. But what can you tell Joe about the Exidy Venture arcade game? Well, this is going to be a challenge, um, and you know, the one thing that I would have to say is. Do you want it to be all original and stuff? I mean, the, one of the best ways to do it may be to just run run a MAME or something that can play it. I mean, I don't know that there's I just a ton of I need to be careful with that. Them. I was about to say that the, the uh, live chat may revolt over that statement. Well, too. if you can find the boards, right. by all means, go for it. You're going to have to scour, post in groups. You're going to have to look on eBay. There's probably not a ton of them out there. If you can find a working board set, we should throw that in there, then you can wire it up and um, just, you're gonna need to find a manual and see uh, how many pins is the wires that go there and find you some connectors and stuff. It's it's doable, but it's gonna be a challenge. 
There you go. Um, let's see. YouTube Punk says Joe should hit up Richie Knuckles in New Jersey. He's got a lot of exity stuff. He does. You know, uh -huh. Tim, I met Richie a couple of times, so he's a good guy. Uh, you could hit him up and see if he's got any of that stuff as well, Joe, that he may give you. Tim's may right, though. Finding a board is a is It a may be even worth to try to find a, a non-working board just so that you can be working on the wiring and everything and then maybe send the board off for repair. Right, exactly. So, um, you know, Exit is an older game, Tim, mm -hmm. and so finding stuff for older games like this is, can be a little bit of a and challenge. And it's like a, if I remember right, it's not JAMA for sure. No. And it's um, kind of a multi-board set, and, and you're right, I don't remember quite what that board was that he showed, but... Uh, what's that board, Jonathan? You, you did you know? Um, so I, I have all the information here. Okay. So I'm gonna I'm gonna throw it up here so you guys can see it. On Exit Adventure, the game PCB is a stacked board set with the sound board on top and the main Logic PCB on the bottom. So mm -hmm. Tim, this is a picture of the board set. You will notice that there is a PCB on top of the main PCB. Okay. So the top PCB, it's a PCB, it's a PCB stack. Okay. The top one is the sound board. The bottom one is the main game board. Okay. okay? Logic board. Okay. It uses a 44 pin edge connection which is J1 on the Logic PCB, okay? So it's actually labeled on there. Uh, so you can you can wire it up based on that. So as it's interface for the cabinet, finding a power supply can be difficult because it not only uses the standard plus five, negative five, and plus 12, but, but it also uses volt. a negative volt, right. a negative 12 volts DC, okay? The good news is that it looks like you have a plus 12 to minus 12 power supply board included in your purchase. Okay, so basically what he can do with that board, and Tim, that was the one that I showed. I'm going to pull uh -huh. it back here so people can see it. That one on the far right. Right. Basically, you can run plus 12 volts DC to this board, and it will output negative, negative 12, 12 volts. Okay. okay, so that way you don't have to worry about um, using a power supply that has the negative 12. Basically, you can use an off-the-shelf standard power supply and run it as long as you have that board. Because that board's going to get you the ne the required negative volts DC. Now, Tim, Mike's Arcade has a um, has a page for Venture that's from the Wiretap archives, okay. and I've linked that here. It's also down in the show description. And of course, Tim, the manual is invaluable for this game. For okay? sure. So there's a link to the manual below, and you can see that as well. Those would be the two the two pieces of information you need in order to get this running. Now, Tim mentioned using Mame or something else. Uh, YouTube Punk says um, you could do Bitkit. I'm not sure if if Venture is on the BitKit board. Okay, I wasn't sure. Right, I'm not. Matt E says you could go is. with Mister, so an FPGA type solution. Tim mm -hmm. may work with this as well, which is basically, which is an emulation, but it's on the hardware level. Right. So I mean, where it's actually, it's actually like a kind of like a, a simulation of the hardware level versus a software emulation. Oh, okay. And so you could do something like that as well. So um, yeah, but it just depends. I mean, that would be up to you. As oh, Joe is here. There you go. He's here watching. So, Joe, it really depends on which way you want to go. Do you want to go all original? Okay? So, if right. you want to go all original, then you're going to have to find the board. You'll have to wire up that 44-pin connector to your cabinet. And then you've got all the parts for the power supply. So, a standard switching power supply that we normally use should be fine with that. RetroArcade.us, HAP, Betson, they all carry that same, you know, that standard switcher. And then just make sure you use the plus 12 to minus 12 uh, power supply board that's included with the purchase in order to get that negative 12 volts to the, to the game board. If you don't want to go that way, then you could try looking into an FPGA type solution, a big kit, uh, a MAME style emulation with like a Raspberry Pi. I mean, those are other ways to go. But Tim, we like going original, sure. and so if you, I mean, you, if you want to go original, you're gonna have to wire it all up. Wire it all up with a, a harness. It's a 44 pin, Tim. That's so good. So get you a 44 pin connector, and then just wire each of the pins where it goes based on the pinouts on the Mike's Arcade side, which we have down below. So he has the pinouts for those. So assuming you can get a working board set, wiring the cabinet should be easy. Mm -hmm. So because you do have everything that you need for that. So, and he says he's up for the challenge. Mm -hmm. okay. So there you go. So uh, let us know what you decide to do, though. Yeah. Okay, because that's going to be probably the biggest part is whether to go an emulation simulation style route or to go with an original board set route. Okay. And so, you know, and what you may say to yourself is say, okay, I'm going to give myself six months to find an original board set. And if I don't find it in six months, we're going, we're going the FPGA mm -hmm. route or we're going to go the, we're going to go the emulation route or something like that. So that may be the best way to go about it. Probably so. Tim, any more thoughts on Joe's question? No, Joe. Keep us in, in the loop, though. We'd be glad to help you more with whatever you decide to do. And like they said, uh, 
it said to contact Richie that he had a lot of Exidy parts. That's probably a good idea too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, you can try contact Richie Knuckles. Uh, he has um, there's a couple email addresses out there. I follow him on Facebook, Tim. There's a couple ways you can get in t- touch with him if you need to. He may be good, a good guy to reach out to in order to see if he has a working board set for you. Uh, let's see. Um, stupid question by YouTube Punk. Negative 12 volts. What does that mean exactly? What makes it negative? So a lot of times uh, a board will will like flip the voltage so that when you add the plus 12 and the minus 12 together, you get a ground. Mm-hmm. Okay. And that's common. We see it with negative 5 volts probably more obviously. Um, but just this is an older board. So it's something that whoever did the engineering on the board said, okay, well, we're going to do something where we need the negative 12 and so that when we combine the two lines, we get a ground kind of thing. So, I mean, it's not unheard of, but it's definitely rare, Tim. We don't see as many boards using negative it's 12. It's probably in the sound. Uh, right. And a lot of, of, time, yeah, a lot of times it has to do with the sound amp or sound circuit on the mm-hmm. board. So just depends. Uh, let's see. Um, Mr. Add-ons for the FPGA stuff. Cool dude. Yeah. So if, yeah, just a, a Mr. Tim is one of the, is one of the big F, uh, FPGA projects for arcade stuff and so and video game stuff. So, I mean, if that's something that you're looking into, that's where you need to go. Uh, same with negative five, please, for midweights like MK for sound. Yes. Mm-hmm. So negative, negative voltage is typically used for sound. That's not always, not always, but um, it can't. That's where a lot of times you'll find it. And like I said, it's kind of so that when you add the two together, you get kind of this zero voltage, which gives you almost like a ground type effect. Mm-hmm. So it just depends. But um, uh, like I said, it, it depends on how the board was engineered and how the people want to do it. Negative five, very common, obviously. Negative twelve, not so much. No, which not is very why this, at all. which is why this had that separate breakout power supply board. Mm-hmm. So uh, let's see. Uh, okay, am I caught up? think so uh Antsman has a question it sounds like this is on a um what do you call those things like a cherry master style board tank. okay he says jacks are better paying out more than winning can the dip switch edit this setting on a cherry master so like it sounds like um like if you get a jack it's paying out more than actually when you yeah. win the game so can i modify this through dip switch settings? should should be but it i don't you know it could be a hard or a soft dip Okay, so, so let's explain that real quick. Okay. So hard dip switches would be actual physical switches on the board. A soft dip would be like a test mode. Like you have to get into the test mode and modify it from there. Um, it depends on what the age of your Cherry Master board is. If mm-hmm. it's older, more than likely it will have an actual physical hardware dip switch on the board that'll do that. Mm-hmm. If it's um, if it's newer, maybe a software dip, something in the test mode that you'll need to go in and modify it that way. So. Uh, Joe has an update. He says, would you, uh, yeah, go ahead and give us an update. He says, would you like to hear that now? Sure. Give us the update on on the venture, Joe, real quick. And maybe I'll wait a second here, Tim, before we move on. And we'll stall for a second. Tim, have you ever played venture? Yes. I have too. It's been a very long time. Fine. Golly. So, um, oh, on the negative 12, uh, Michael Bloom says, also, if you connect negative 12 with plus 12, that can give you 24 volts to work if you needed that for something. That is correct. So if you wanted to add the two voltages together, you could get double the voltage. Mm-hmm. So, you know, 24 volts plus 24, very, actually more common than negative 12, right? So you could also get that as well. So it's, it's just a way that um, engineers can use to get, to kind of modify voltages without having those voltages directly on the board, if that makes sense. So, and, or having them come directly from a power supply. So... It just really depends. So, uh, so when's the last time you played Venture? Oh gosh, uh, probably twenty years ago. I I think I we know. played. I want to say I played it at the Houston show. Yeah, probably. I think that's I I think that's where I played it the last time. Um, I was trying to think. You know, the Houston show guys. There's so many collectors there that have rare stuff. Mm-hmm. Played a lot of cool rare stuff at the Houston show. Um. Might try to go that this year, Tim. I don't know. Oh, we need to. Yeah, we should. I I, I still haven't played like any of the new pinball machines. Mm-hmm. Like I'm really looking forward to playing new pinball machines, and I just haven't. You know, obviously, Tim, with uh, you know, with pandemic stuff and everything, I really want to go to Texas Pinball Festival, but that ended up not working for either of us. Uh, I will. Should we say something about the after show real quick? Sure. So last time that we um, that we all got together, I mentioned I had my birthday at the movie theater, and mm-hmm. we watched Sonic Two. So in the in the after show, I'll be talking about my review of Sonic the Hedgehog Two. Okay. So you guys can watch that. Um, let's. See. Um, Antsman says yes. Hard dip is on the board. So yes, you should be able uh, on the Cherry Master Tim mm-hmm. hard dip switches. Try those first. Best to find a manual for your board before you do that. Make sure you know what those dip switches do. Don't just go willy-nilly adjusting the dip switches. Find a manual. If you don't have one in the game, see if you can find one online. Because, Tim, adjusting those dip switches can cause some weird mm-hmm. stuff if you don't know what you're flipping. Or make make sure you write down where the current 
is so you can get back to that and also make sure you turn the power off when you're doing changing your dip switch agreed so yeah in order for the dip switches to take effect in most games you have to turn off the power flip the dip turn it back on something to keep in mind uh let's see oh michael said on my colloquial let's see on my colloquial vision back in 84 or or Col- oh playing yeah. adventure yeah that's where i played it a lot on yeah coleco i always say it wrong mm-hmm. so coleco vision uh probably so there you go I have an NOS marquee, this is from John, that has the predictive paper still on it. Is it, or is it, it's on real good. Any tips on how to get it off easily? WD-40. Yeah, WD-40 may help a little bit. Um, the problem is, man, if the you start. The paper is stuck on it. Yeah, if you start peeling it, there's a good chance. It's going to rip off some of the paint. Yeah. Um, I don't know if there's a good way. I mean, you can try to stick some WD-40 up underneath there, Tim, as you go. So if you if you can spray it up underneath would, the paper yeah, as you go. Yeah, I would go. just spray it, let it soak in really good and get kind of some of those oils up into the stuff. But I know what he's talking about. Uh, we I got a new old, start, uh, new old stock uh, side art. I know um, bezel one time for a game, and I went to... Just rip it off and just rip half the paint off. Yep. Right, right off. Yeah. So I would try try some WD-40 as you go. So kind of peel up just a little edge where maybe there's not as much artwork or just mm-hmm. the corner and just kind of spray some WD-40 in there. But the problem is, I mean, you know, especially if it's been stored in a hot place. Here mm-hmm. in Texas, there's a lot of hot outdoor places, Tim. A lot of times that artwork will melt to that paper. Mm-hmm. And then, yeah, I mean, you might as well just have a clear place piece of glass at that point. So... Um, but you can try the WD-40, just kind of lifting up a corner and kind of spraying as you go to see if that does anything. So, Okay, Joe hasn't uh, sent us back an update, Tim. I think we're okay. about to move on. I will, before we move on, though, I will remind uh, everybody out there that uh, Sunday is Mother's Day. Right. So do something nice for your mama. <laughs> okay, go, I don't know, take her dinner, uh, get uh, get her flowers, card at least, and make sure you call. For sure. Day. So, Okay. Um, Michael says maybe isopropyl alcohol. Maybe. Maybe. Um, somebody says uh, YouTube Punk plastic razor. Um, you could take the razor as you go, but I'm still I'm still very worried that that would take up the art. Yeah, I still think WD-40 would probably work the best, and you just really soak it. Yeah, sounds mm-hmm. good. Okay, we're gonna move on. Uh, Joe, if you have that update though, we'll we'll still keep you here. So just let us know how it's going from there. Tim, let us move on to our next question from Carl. And Carl says, I recently acquired an old 1982 Zaxxon cabinet. It was in pretty bad shape. It had rats living in it at one time. Okay. I think that's pretty bad shape. Probably on that uh, one. Yeah. Anyway, a guy was throwing it away, and I've always wanted a real arcade cabinet of my own. I have I have sound, and I've got the marquee light to work, but I think I have vertical collapse. I don't really understand how to fix it. I watched your videos, and I've read up on it, but I haven't taken the board out yet. I can solder decently, but I'm not a pro at it. I'm a little confused as to what kind of issues I'm looking for. IC chip, caps. So that's my question. I know you must discharge the monitor first. I'm just a little chicken because I don't want to get zapped or ruin something. Okay, so uh, we've got our rat infested Zaxxon here. The Carl <laughs> has. No. Right. Um, look, guys. Um, Tim, I don't know how many times we've seen rat droppings or rats inside oh, our sure. cabinets. It's guys, it's common because um, you know when these things get taken off location, they get stored in warehouses. And Tim, what tend to live in warehouses around here? Yeah. Rats, and so they make it their home. And so uh, Carl, it. no hard feelings there. Mm-hmm. It happens. Look, you got a free arcade cabinet. All right. Okay, that's that that's awesome in itself. So Tim, it does sound. He's getting sound, so mm-hmm. that's promising. We're getting marquee light. That's promising, but he's getting, it sounds like, vertical collapse. Uh, I mean, that's yeah. how he describes it, so we're going to take you at your word that you've watched our, that you've seen our videos and you know what it looks like. So, Tim, we have this nice, we have this nice line across the screen on our Zaxxon cabinet. What does Carl need to do in order to get that taken care of? Right, well, um, he's going to, he can go ahead and do a cap kit. That will help him. Uh, but then the, you're just going to have to rebuild that vertical output. Um, there's transistors and stuff in there. and uh, But mostly if he'll do a cap kit, it may just cure it right off the bat. That's right. where we would start. So I, I'm going to give him a little... Uh, I did some more research, Tim. I'm always doing my research here. Um, mm. uh, YouTube Punk calls this Raxon. <laughs> <laughs> so, rat Good name. <laughs> so there you go. Um, mm. So I'm going to... Here's the research I did, Tim. Zaxxons usually came with uh, K4900s or G07s. Right. Okay, so that's what we know. 
So, and this is from our experience too, but I also looked this up. Zaxxon cabinets usually have Wells Garner K4900 monitors installed in them or Geo 7s. If you do have vertical collapse on a K4900, you will need to check the vertical output transistors. And Tim, I have the locations there. Good. Check the resistor at uh, R313 is open. Oh, here. I'll read all this for people who may not be watching this. Check the vertical output transistors at positions Q302 and 303. If those check out, check resistor 313, R313, see if it's open. Uh, and then check the caps at C311, C306, C308, and C313 as well. You may want to install a cap kit at this point. I mean, if you're going to replace that many caps right. or check that many caps and you got the monitor out, just install the cap kit. And then IC301 can cause this as well if it goes bad, but that's rare. Okay. So that's on a K4900. And Tim, the reason I did the K4900 is because that's the most common Zaxxon monitor that we've seen. Yeah, um, and I've, I've talked to people too about Zaxxons and the vast majority of people will say K4900. Okay. You may have a Geo7. If you have a Geo7, get back with me, Carl, and we can go from there. Uh, we can tell you some troubleshooting on that. But basically all those parts, like Tim mentioned, are in the vertical section of the chassis. Okay. So as for discharging, Tim, the process is pretty safe. Right. It's so easy that Tim can do it and right. I can do it. So, I mean, that says something. Once it's you've done enough. it, it's really not as difficult or it sounds. And even as long as your game has been off for a little while, like an hour, a few hours, you're going to be pretty safe anyway. Right. But it'll store some, but not enough to really hurt. Consider taking additional precautions. Now, Tim, in the video that we shot, we do not do these, but we do mention them in the post. And that is, and you see, in the post for safely discharging our arcade monitor, mm -hmm. rubber gloves, All right? eye protection. Okay, those two things alone. And make sure you have a, you know, and if you're worried about making your tool, your discharging tool, order one from somebody. Okay, so the real Bob Roberts, mm -hmm. he sells them still. You can get a discharging tool from him. There's a lot of different outlets that do it. If you if you think you're going to have a career in arcade repair tip, in mm -hmm. arcade repair, get you one of the high voltage probes right. that discharges, that brings down the voltage gently on mm -hmm. the monitor. If it this is just going to be like a one time hobby for you, I'm going to fix this Exxon cabinet and I'm done. Screwdriver method is fine, works mm -hmm. great. But those little high voltage probes that you can stick under there, Tim, and it discharges them, those are awesome. Okay. Mm -hmm. But if you're nervous about it, you may invest in that or buy a pre made one. Because then you'll know it works. You don't have to worry about it. If you make your own sometimes, Tim, you got to worry about that, right? Right. You better know what you're doing. <laughs> exactly. So rubber gloves, eye protection, and get a pre-made tool if you're really worried about that. And Tim, we talk about that in that post. I know a lot mm -hmm. of people will just watch the video. You don't read the post. But the post has additional information to the videos, guys. So if you're ever like just watching one of our videos, I promise the post has more information than the video in it. Sure. Okay, and we do that. We do that because we just add a little. Sometimes we... Uh, we don't shoot things like Tim. A lot of times we don't use the, you know, the rubber glove or anything because mm -hmm. we've done so many times at this point we're pretty comfortable with it. But the first time you do something, you may want to use the rubber glove. You want, you want to make sure you're wearing the rubber sole shoes. You want to make sure that you have a tool that works, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So, um, but it's not as bad as you think. One time we took a monitor up to our down to Houston and literally had people discharge monitors there. It was fun. So yeah. I mean, just to show you that it can be done, uh, it's not bad, and uh, we're still alive. I've even stuck a screwdriver under one that was plugged in. So I mean, mm -hmm. we're all good. we're all survived. We're all still alive. Um, nerve damage, but you know, <laughs> other than that, we're good. So uh, there you go. So uh, anything else for Carlton before we move on on his no. racks on? <laughs> Good luck with the racks on. There you go. <laughs> so there we go. Uh, Carl, if you have any other questions, please let us know. We'll try to help you out further there. Okay, uh, Tim. So Joe gave his update. He says he found a non-working PCB set for the Venture. Nice. Okay. Same guy that sold me a new power supply and side art. He okay. also gave me the name of a person who, can, who custom makes any arcade harness. I have my order in for Venture. Awesome. So, it sounds like you've got everything you need, Joe. Um, you could have made that harness yourself. Uh, yeah. And I know it, it would have been more time on your part. All you have to do is just get the 44-pin edge connector, and then you could have just wired it. Okay? Yeah. But it's nice to have it done for you, too. If for you can sure. afford it, do it. <laughs> Let right. somebody else do it. Let's, ha let's work on you. Uh, but it's not that hard to make one yourself. Tim, we should probably show a video on that. Mm -hmm. In all that spare time that we have. Sure. Yeah. So, um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's not hard to make a harness yourself. You can make a jam harness. You can make anything. As long as you find the right edge connector, I mean, you can make it. Put it on our list today. Yeah, I will. <laughs> Here's the thing. We'll shoot it and then I won't edit it. <laughs> That's like half the videos we have. So there you go. But anyway, uh, Joe, we want to hear your updates. So keep us posted on what, what happens once you get all the, everything together and hopefully you can get all in there and it'll start working. Sure. Hopefully the monitor works too. I, I guess think. you don't know that yet. No. We'll find out. 
So, um, but let us know. Give us an update on your venture. We'd love to hear it. So, let's see. Um, YouTube Punk says, standing in a kiddie pool during discharge is not recommended. All right. That is right. Well, I mean, as long as it's not full, filled with water, I think you'd be okay. So, right? Right. Yeah, you'd be okay. So, there you go. But uh, anyway, so Joe, yeah, keep us posted, and uh, we can't wait to hear. Hopefully, you get it all. Hopefully, you just put it together and it'll work. Wouldn't that be awesome? That yeah. would be that'd be great. There's a chance of that. Yeah, so, you never know. Same. Okay. Okay, Tim. Well, we have come to the part of the show where we're doing our quick questions and answers. And Tim, I basically just took the same question okay. and put it on here twice from right. two different people. So we only have we usually have three for this section. We usually do them rapid fire. Okay. This month we're just going to answer these two because they're kind of related and treat it like it's one question. I that bet and that's where the word hunting comes in. You got it. Very mm -hmm. good. Look at this, <laughs> man. Your powers of deduction astound me, <laughs> Mr. Holmes. I assume we're getting down to the nitty gritty here. There you go. So here we go. Uh, this is the two questions. This are these are the two okay. questions. Austin says, I have an original Big Buck Hunter Arcade. It was going great, but recently it started to not shoot accurately. Even after calibrating and getting a new gun, it will work for a little while and then goes back to shooting all over the screen. Okay. So, Tim, obviously we calibrated, it's still shooting all over the screen for Even a while. Even with a new gun. Right. Okay. Now, we have Bobby here who says, my extreme hunting has, has right to left drift on both guns. I've opened them up and i checked them. The only thing I haven't done is turn up the brightness. After calibration, they track up and down perfectly. Just they slowly move from far left to, or from far right to left, then off the screen. Which is weird. Mm -hmm. um, but Tim, all the, both of these have to do with light guns and calibrating and not getting accurate Accu like an accurate positioning with the gun. So do you have any advice here for Bobby and Austin that might help them in their gun accuracy issues? With their well, the first issues? thing that you got to check, especially since he has a new gun, is the wiring going to the gun into the board. Make sure, sure that the board pins and everything are really good in there. I would reflow the solder on the back of those pins where it plugs in. There's also a chip usually underneath that. Um, I think it's uh, which game is it? Uh, one of them was Big Buck Hunter, and one one of them was uh, if Extreme Hunting. Both of them two are optimal. player. Yeah, both so of them are optimal. Does it does it happen if you move it to the two player side and try over there? That's a great that's a great idea. So if you swap the guns, do you get the same result? Right. Because I think because, both those are two player. Yeah, and they both have chips underneath them. Because a lot of times I would do that and move the chip over, and it would solve my problem because it would be the two the the chip underneath and the the two-player one would be just fine. Right. Uh, he probably plays a lot of one-player. Uh, but those are a couple things that I would check. First, the wiring, really good solder on the back where the pins go in, and then the chips right underneath there. And a lot of times they're not so or they're socketed for that reason that they do go bad. Awesome. So, Tim, I put a couple other things in here, too, okay. but I liked your answer. Um, so... Make sure you check the wiring. That's what Tim said. Mm -hmm. Runs from the game board all the way to your gun board. This wiring tends to get beat up. Bad. Mm -hmm. Okay, like kids twist guns. They turn guns. They they um, they drop guns. <laughs> what all do they do to guns, Tim? I mean, these light guns take a beating. Okay, and so check that wiring. Touch up the solder. Okay, like Tim mentioned. Cleaning the monitor screen helps as well. I love Tim's suggestion of sw switching the guns. So if you mm -hmm. have two guns, switch them and see if the problem follows the gun or if it or if it doesn't. Okay, if right. it follows the gun, then you know the problem's in, the, in gun. the gun. If it doesn't follow the gun, then you may have a board issue. And like Correct. Tim mentioned, there are socketed chips on a lot of these boards. Um, Big Buck Hunter, in particular, Tim probably has that. Mm -hmm. But extreme hunting is a Thomas wave. Right. So it's a little bit different in the way it. that it works. It may, because I think it has a gun interface board okay. that actually hooks up to it. So it may have that same thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think checking that, swapping the guns may help, because that way you can determine what kind of issue you're having. And then uh, we also have turning up the brightness can sometimes help the drift that yes. you're experiencing. That's something to keep in yeah, mind. Yeah, he said he hadn't tried that. And I right. was like, well, I would definitely try that. Yeah, exactly. Of course, you can also try replacing the optical sensor or the gun board entirely inside the guns, Tim. Um, those do go bad. Optical mm. sensors, sometimes you have to touch the solder up on those, Tim, to make sure they register properly. It's not uncommon. Uh, lenses in there. If the lenses get scratched up on mm -hmm. the sides or something like that, you may need to replace the entire lens or clean it. So all that kind of stuff. Tim, we have an entire section of stuff on our troubleshooting light gun issues post mm -hmm. and video. So make sure you check that out there, Austin and Bobby. Hopefully that 
Well, so between all of those tips, you'll figure out what's going on with your gun games. Both of them, Tim, they're different games, but they all work on the same premise. They're optical based like guns, and they all work the same. Now, Tim, um, we had somebody leave a comment on our on our YouTube video for troubleshooting light gun okay. issues that I'm going to bring in here. Uh, YouTube user Case the Corvette Man was saying that he was saying turning up the brightness may not be effective at helping uh, gun accuracy issues. Okay, okay. That's what he said. Okay, and he was saying his solution is to increase the contrast instead, and maybe increase the blue color. Okay. Okay, and so um, he was saying light guns tend to register just the blue color. Okay. So, and you know, I didn't know this, Tim. Okay. I was not That's familiar with info. this. Maybe exactly this is information that we needed. And so he actually did a video, Tim, where he had a light gun and he had a projector with red, green, and blue. And when he covered up the green and the blue, or the green and the red, and just had the blue, the light gun would register. But when he covered up the red, uh, or when he covered up the blue and just had the red and the green, it would mm -hmm. not register. Okay. And so you may try just increasing your contrast and your blue color level on your monitor to see if that helps. I'm not going to go as far to say that the brightness doesn't help because, Tim, I think we've had too many instances sure. where it did. But I will say that you may want to try what he suggests too. Try adjusting the contrast. Try adjusting the blue level on your monitor. This is to Austin and... Um, Austin and Bobby, try adjusting those as well and see if it helps your issues. So turn up your blue just a little bit more, turn up your contrast just a little bit more, see if it helps. Tim, typically we would say um, with like Lethal Enforcers, it has a color bar mm -hmm. um, screen that allows you to adjust your colors and make sure that all your colors are in balance. And we'd suggest doing that, especially for light gun games, Tim, making sure that all your colors are balanced properly. And make sure, mm -hmm. you know, and you can do that by going into there and then adjusting each of them. And then maybe turning up the contrast a little bit as well. <clears throat> but yeah, that's what I mean. If that helps you guys, that's great. I did not know that, Tim. I didn't know. I didn't know that it basically keys off of the blue color. But his video pretty much shows that. And you guys can see. I put a link to that video down below for okay. Case the Corvette Man, so you guys can actually see his demonstration and how it works. He uses a gun con too, which Tim is a PlayStation Two gun. Okay. Uh, that's used for like Time Crisis, for instance. So just to give you an idea. But if you want to see that video, got a link down below. You guys can check that out. Uh, but apparently, it keys off that blue. So you do want to make sure that the blue in your picture is is maybe a little bit higher even maybe just turned up a little bit more than you normally would feel it like sounds it. reasonable there you go so and like i said he demonstrated it so i mean it obviously is a thing so mm -hmm. like i said i'm not going to say that the brightness does not help it mm. may still help but uh, you may try the contrast in the blue too so okay so tim i think that does it for the questions all righty so in the live chat yeah i was about to go over here let's see what we got here um john says what are your recommendations on bulletproofing a cinematronics vector game um, I don't have, I don't know. Probably John's Arcade would probably be a better person to ask. I, I, outside of just replacing um, all your um, those top hats on it and um, making sure that it's good and grounded and probably. Um, I was gonna say, do you remember um, a, a couple I'm of live to think shows? Of what have we done before that? Remember a couple of live shows back, we were talking about that specific vector monitor and how they had made a new power supply for it. Mm -hmm. Install something like that on it, something that's kind of and I forget what that thing was called. If I can, I'd have to look back a couple of live show episodes mm -hmm. to see. But there's a specific vector monitor, Tim, that they were having problems with it overheating. Mm -hmm. And so they had created their own power supply. This uh, It was like a, I, yeah. it was an arcade somewhere. And if you go back through our live show archive, you'll find it. But if you have a Wells Garner vector monitor, I believe that's what it fit. And so get something like that for the vector monitor because that will help with your power supply overheating for sure. And then just make sure your power supply that you're using in the game is giving consistent voltage. And you may want to, if your power supply is a rebuild kit, you may want to install the rebuild kit on that power supply if you're using the original, not using a switcher. Uh, but outside of that, Tim, I can't think well, of anything any, else. Anything that I, when I'm talking about bulletproof in a game, most of the time I'm adding three or four fans. The cooler that they can run, the better. Right. It's I, I was thinking about pole position, you know, and stuff, and how after we put some fans in there, it helped it so much. So one fan going in, one fan coming out uh, would definitely be uh, advisable. Something that keeps it cool and air flowing through there is going to help you greatly. There you go. Uh, let's see. And he also says, uh, since you are a different John says, since you guys are in Texas, here's a question for you. What do you keep your de de dehumidifier set at in the summer for your game room? Tim, I've never used a dehumidifier and, no. um, I've never had the problem. Uh, our heat here, it, it's not as humid as like what you get in, in Houston. Yeah. Houston probably has that problem a little bit more than we do. We're further North of that. 
So um, some of our guys in Houston, like the Game Preserve Tim, I would, mm-hmm. would probably be better people to reach out to for something like that. Here I we doubt do, that they do it either, though. Most yeah, I mean here we don't we just we don't have the humidity. It does get humid and hot, but not like it does further south. Right. So it just it just or south depends Louisiana where or something. Right. Exactly. It really gets hot and sticky down there. Right. Exactly. So we don't have that problem as much here. Uh, yeah, but I've never actually used a dehumidifier. But I've worked on a lot of games in South Louisiana, and I've never. Never even thought about it. Yeah, but I mean, it could help definitely. I'm yeah. Not saying it couldn't. Uh, I don't know what I would set it on, but mm-hmm. I mean, it, look, it can only help. <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. It would definitely help. I would, as much as you can, take the humid humidity down. It's definitely going to help uh, keep stuff from oxidizing and stuff like that over time for sure. Agreed. Okay, Tim, well, we're done with the questions. Okay. Okay, so let us move on to the discussion portion of our show, guys. And uh, the first story that we have here is, um, and Tim, this is actually the title of the mm-hmm, article. I remember that. Tonight, I will dream about this $9,000 digital pinball machine with a 55-inch screen. And this is from Gizmodo, Tim. They say, the Skillshot FX digital pinball at $8,999 is more expensive than most of the real pinball machines that Stern Pinball still sells. Before that price, you get access to 96 different virtual pinball machines, courtesy of Zen Studios Pinball FX3 software. The playfield features a massive 55 inch LCD HD screen safely located beneath a protective glass covering that is paired with a 32 inch display on the machine's vertical back box, displaying matching animations and a digital scoreboard. It's running Windows 10 and has Wi-Fi built in. So you're buying a $9,000 computer here, Tim, right. with two screens on it. <laughs> but, Tim, you know what? I kind of felt like this was something that needed to be debated. So tonight, it is the return <laughs> of the arcade debate. And our question is, will people buy the Skillshot FX digital pinball machine over other options available? Tim, is this thing going to find an audience? That okay. is the question, okay? So you can decide okay. here in this right now what... What side of the debate you're going to take, and I'll take that's the opposite. Easy side. No, the, you're going to be easy. I see yeah, how it is. I'm going to give me the tough stuff. Take the one that's the obvious. Okay, and we're in our boxes. Check this out. It's been a while. <laughs> I like my box, home sweet box. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so we'll we'll take a minute here, and we'll uh, we'll reset like we normally do, and then we'll get into the debate. Well, Tim, welcome back to the arcade debate segment for this evening. And Tim, I don't know if you've heard, but there's a new digital pinball machine on the block, the Skillshot FX. Now, this digital pinball machine uh, plays pinball FX tables. It has a Windows 10 PC in it, 55-inch screen that it actually uses for the playfield, 32-inch monitor in the back box, and sells for almost $9,000. So tonight, we are going to debate whether or not People will actually buy this. Will this find an audience, Tim? Or is this just a product with nobody to purchase it? So, Tim, I'm throwing it to you. What side of the debate do you take tonight? Do you think people will purchase this or do you not? I think they'll sell about five of them to their aunt and a couple of other people that uh, felt sorry for them. I don't know. I don't see anybody paying that much for a digital pinball game. So I will take the opposite of you, Tim, and I will say people will buy this, Tim, and it's because of the way it will be marketed, Tim. I see this in high designer showcase furniture environments where people are buying really expensive furniture. Tim, I don't know if you've actually seen this thing. It has a nice wood grain to it. It looks very professional, very sleek. I think if you get the right buyer that comes in for a couch into a high-end furnishings uh, business and sees that, maybe they'll go home with a pinball machine too. I do think this can find an audience. Tim, what do you think? Why won't it find an audience? Why won't people purchase it? Well, because I think for that price, you could buy a new pinball game, which are very expensive in their own, and build your own. So it's just it just seems way overpriced when you price it more than an original pinball game, which everybody would agree has gone up in value and have become really expensive. To think about spending even more money that, they have a hard enough time getting people to buy brand new actual pinball games, I think they will run into some difficulty with people being willing to spend more than that. Now, Tim, the only thing is that when you buy a pinball machine, you play one game. Okay, you play you know, uh, Deadpool or you play ACDC. You play that one game, this thing has 95 games on it. 
and maybe the and maybe a possibility of being able to play more since it's a digital pinball platform. So that's a big selling point here, I think, for a lot of people. Like I said, if you walk into a high-end furnishings business, you see this next to this high-end sofa that you're looking at, you may consider it, Tim, just because it does look like a high-quality piece of furniture and also features all of this great information on it. And Tim, I mean, it's got that 55-inch screen, very large playfield style for this. I, I do agree with you that the price is a little on the high side. With that said, what do you think something like this would sell for in order for people to buy it? I think you're probably about half that price to get people just to buy it, just to rush out and get it. Because at that price, you're com think about who your compet competitors are. You can get a multimorphic for that price who actually plays like a real pinball game and has a big screen in it and comes with the kits. And then the kits you buy after that, you would own the, the cabinet to do it in. This one comes with the 96. You're right, but that's is that all you have the rights to? Is there future games that are going to be added? What are the 96 titles? Are they the really big games? Or is it just a bunch of obscure pinball games that we've never heard of? That would be my question. So I'm glad you brought up the Multimorphic, Tim, because here's the thing. Yes, it is about a $10,000 initial investment on the Multimorphic, but the, and you can play some titles with that same back play field, but you got to remember, you've got to invest in upgrades. The new Weird Al game, Tim, for Multimorphic is going to be like an extra $3,500 or $3,000. And on top of the $10,000, here I'm getting 92 or 96 games, however many, 90-something games. For one price, I don't have to pay more for upgrades. And Tim, it sounds like there may be eventual tables added as well, and I won't need to buy buy an extra piece of play field in order to get that. So it's kind of like I'm investing in this one-time $9,000 fee. I'm going to be able to play a lot of games going forward. So I love the multimorphic concept. And I think, you know, it's, if you're looking at side by side, I think that's a very apt comparison. But with multimorphic, you do have to invest more in the back play fields where you would not have to with something like this. What do you say to that? I think you have three customers. Elon Musk, Mark Zuckerberg, and Bill Gates. They're about the only people who are going to be able to afford it. <laughs> well, here's, like I said, Tim, you got that guy who's in the, in his furniture store for some high-end furniture. If this is sitting by that high-end furniture, what's to say he doesn't go ahead and throw that on with the rest of the stuff he's trying to finance? That's all I'm saying. Maybe maybe so. I guess time will tell. What, do you, what, do you, what does our audience think? That's what I want to know. So let us know what you guys think. Do you think that the Skillshot FX digital pinball machine will find an audience at its $9,000 price point? And then if not... What price point do you think would be good for this product? So, again, chime in. You can chime in in the comments section below or just let us know. Questions at ArcadeRepairTips.com. We'd love to hear your opinions on this. And we'll see you next time for the next Arcade Debate. Take care. Ah, there we go. Yeah, hey, look at that. It's been a while. Mm -hmm. So, okay, I'm going to go ahead and switch this back here. I'm getting out of this box. I feel trapped. <laughs> there we go. Okay. So nine thousand dollars, I think, is high too. Yeah, uh, for what it's worth. I don't worth. know. You know, I haven't seen one. I haven't played it for sure. Right. So I can show the picture up here too. It does. I mean, it looks kind of cool. So, yeah. I mean, you can look. It looks like a high end piece of furniture. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm saying. So I envision this thing in a high end furniture store next to all the stuff you're trying to buy. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's why I picture this thing, and. It does have Wi-Fi. It does run Windows 10. So, I mean, the fact that it runs Windows 10 mean, means that you may be able to play a lot more on it than just what comes with it. Right, but you're saying a high-end furniture store. Is this going to be next to a bed that will adjust in a king-size bed that costs $3,000? And I'm going, I'm going to pay three times what I've got to sleep in every night? I, that's where it's going to be. It's going to be a hard sell. But if you sell to the right person, it might sell. I don't know. Yeah. What's a, what uh, are let's guys see what, saying about I was about it? to say, I'll bring back the live chat here, and then let's see what we got here. Um, YouTube Punk says, pricey, pricey. Uh, YouTube Punk says, Tim is putting on his brass knuckles. <laughs> you going to hit me right here, boy? Uh, let's see. Uh, YouTube Punk, a TV should run about maybe $1,000. A PC for pinball shouldn't be more than 600 The rest is materials and cost of software. Seems way overpriced. Yeah. Agreed. Seahorses at night says, um, or let's see, Seahorses all night says, people will train their skills. Uh, hot spot for a hamburger if things keep going this way. Or skill shot. There's skill shot for a hamburger. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> uh, Geeklight uh, says, wives will never let it happen for normal people. So there right. you go. Uh, Michael says, never played one of the ultra high-end virtual pinball machines, but the regular ones suck compared to the real thing. Um, John says it should be about 6K. Okay. So I think 5 to 6 is the sweet spot. But here's the thing. Who's to say you can't set your sights high, Tim, right. and then run a sale? Right. Okay. Hey, we were selling for 9. Guess what, Tim? We're selling uh -huh. for 6 now. Right. You know, Sounds but I'm still better. making money. You know, whatever the case may be. So, you know, I have the arcade one up, Arc Attack from Mars. We've played it. 
mm-hmm. with the new software update, it actually plays pretty decently. Look, guys, it's not pinball. Right. Okay, that's the, the first thing you have to remember is that it's not a real pinball machine. But I have, I still enjoy playing Attack from Mars on this thing. I do. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, it's better than playing it on my phone. Right. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? That's what I For compare sure. it to. I'm not comparing it to playing the real pinball machine. Right. What does a real Attack from Mars cost? Exactly. Okay. That thing cost me 400 bucks. So that's what that's the problem with this. It costs more than the real game. So it's right. like, uh, yeah, I get it. You get 96 games, but you could we could probably mod this and put a bunch of games on but it. But you're also too. talking about a 32 inch screen and a very small monitor in the back, whereas this thing has a 55 inch screen for the play field and a right. huge monitor. I in the doubt back. I would get and, any... and a PC. This has like an Android. This has an Android mini board. Right. This has a full on PC. True. So I mean, you're getting a lot. Is it overpriced? Probably. But that just means you can put a really good sale on. I agree. So you know, I don't think there's anything. Time like will that. tell. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Johnson, I'd rather play um, VR pin sim with my Oculus Quest. Mm-hmm. So if you got an o- Oculus Quest, you can play VR pinball. Mm-hmm. Some people already do that. That's fine. Uh, but yeah, I think it's. I think it is. Um, I think it is expensive as well. So we'll just see, right? right? We'll see. Time will tell. Exactly. So there you go. Arcade debate. Mm-hmm. It's been a while. It was fun. <laughs> so maybe we can bring that back more often. So. Okay, um, more news here, Tim. Let's go to this next one here. Pac-Man has a new wife, thanks to the Miss Pac-Man drama. And this is from Polygon. Tim, uh, Polygon wasn't the only one who picked it up. A lot of different news outlets have picked okay. this up. But Miss Pac-Man is steadily disappearing thanks to a Byzantine dispute involving Bandai Namco and At Games. So you may remember, Tim, we had a story where At Games had purchased right. the uh, royalty the royalties from GCC, from the people who, uh, General Computing Corporation, mm-hmm. the people who had a royalty right to Ms. Pac-Man. So now At Games gets that royalty right. Now here's the deal. Bandai Namco can still use the character any way they want to. They okay. have complete control of the character, but anytime the character is used, they have to pay a royalty fee to At Games. That's how this works. Okay. So in the recent release of 1984's Pac-Land, Tim, so like on the Switch and some other consoles, mm-hmm. Uh, Bandai Namco has replaced Miss Pac-Man with Pac-Mom. And you can see ah. the picture over here. And she wears a pink hat, gloves, and heels instead of a red bow, orange gloves, and red boots. While Bandai Namco still has full ownership and use of Miss Pac-Man and Baby Pac, the characters, Ad Games owns a royalty interest in them and and receives a payment anytime either of those characters are used. So even but in Baby Pac, Pac here, they, they did a palette swap to make it not look like Baby Pac. Okay. Okay. So here's the deal. It's kind of sad because it means that Miss Pac-Man's kind of disappearing. Wow, that is sad. So, I mean, it's just, uh, you know, we're getting Pac-Mom replace, mm-hmm. replacements in these new games because they don't want to pay the royalty fees. Okay. So hopefully Namco and Ad Games, Bandai Namco and Ad Games can figure this out, Tim. They can figure out some way to, you know, to come to uh, terms to where we can see Miss Pac-Man and more stuff. Again. For sure. So, but we'll see. Uh, it is what it is, and I think it's rough, and uh, mm-hmm. you know, but you know, they don't want to pay those royalty fees. Right. That's what it comes down to. Not so, a fan of the Pac Mom. Yeah, exactly. Um, Michael uh, on the pinball machines, he says, "Do you get the knock?" With the virtual pinball machines, because that's such a huge part of the game. So, on the Attack from Mars, there are solenoids built into the game that simulate it. Oh, really? Yes. You, you've been there, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, you felt them. So, um, the Arcade 1-Up has solenoids in the game that actually do simulate it. Now, it's a simulation. You can tell. The knock is there, though. Is it mm. as loud as a regular pinball machine? No. no. Okay? But they're in there, and so you do get a little bit of a feel. That's mm. what I'm saying. Playing on this is play- better than playing on your phone. Uh, a lot that. better. But is it as good as playing the real thing? Sure. No. No. So there you go. Uh, let's see. Tim says, I agree with Tim. Way too expensive and other options out there. So there you go. One for you. <laughs> I agree with you too. Yeah, I agree too. Uh, so there you go. Uh, Mr. Dwayne's here. He says, sorry, I'm late. You're never late. You're yeah. always on time. That's how this works, right? Yeah. So there you go. So thanks for being on time. So uh, there we go. Um, but yeah, so we just got done with the Miss Pac-Man. And uh, just what are your thoughts on that? I mean, does it matter to you that they replaced Miss Pac-Man with Pac-Mom? Is that a big deal to you? Mm-hmm. Is it a big deal to you? No. Nah. I mean, I don't know if it is. Not really. I mean, as long as the original Miss Pac-Man is still around. Right, exactly. Yeah. So I can play Miss Pac-Man. I'm right. not worried about Pac-Mom. Exactly. So, okay. Uh, let us go to our next news item here, Tim. Tetris Arcade Machine is now the world's largest standing at 16 feet. 
Okay. This is the Guinness Book of World Records, Tim. We had this on our on our uh, social media pages this month. And it says, The record for the world's largest arcade machine was recently broken in by Mad Lab in Spain. The entertainment venue has a machine that measures 16 feet tall. The arcade machine features a working version of Tetris, a popular building block puzzle game originating from, from the late 80s. Uh, in order to play the machine, guests need to acquire a giant coin from reception and climb steps to reach the playable button. So there <laughs> okay. you go. Uh, pretty cool. You can see the big coin there. I think he's got his hand on it, like in the picture oh, to the okay. right there. And the buttons do work. Um, you know, Tim, just uh, pretty cool. Just something cool. Now, I've, I, I think when we posted this, some people were saying, I can make one bigger than 16 mm. feet. Do it. Right. Beat it. Okay. You know, that's, that's how records are. I feel All like right. records are made to be broken. So, what were you going to say, Tim? I, I think it's definitely uh, something that's doable. Yeah. So, why I mean, 16 not? feet is pretty big. Yeah, it's still pretty big. I think tall. you could go bigger. That's a pretty If tall you game. can, let yeah. us know. We'd love to see it. Uh, so, I just thought that was interesting, and, you know, a lot of people talking about it on our social media pages as well. Uh, YouTube Punk says he's going to trademark Pac Mam. Oh, okay. So, Pac Mam. Maybe that's the, maybe that's the next one they're gonna go with. Maybe so. Uh, what's another another one that we can go with? You know, <laughs> I don't know. We'll figure something out. So, okay, uh, this was something Tim that Mark was really interested in. Uh, our one of our social media contributors, and that's the arcade one up Dragon's Layer cabinet, which okay. is now available for pre order. So Tim, it looks really nice, and they put an LCD screen in the back for the scores, just like the original Dragon's Layer cabinet had. Of course, it had LEDs. LED um, readouts for the scores and everything. But the fact that they separated that out from the main screen makes it look more authentic to me. It does. So, I mean, definitely does. So, the Arcade 1-Up Dragon's Lair Home Arcade Cabinet includes the title game plus the sequel, Dragon's Lair 2 Time Warp, and the sci-fi adventure-themed Space Ace. Features include a secondary alphanumeric screen for score information, light-up marquee, molded coin door. So it actually has a molded coin door on the Oh, front. okay. Okay. And then a custom riser. Estimated shipping date is late summer. If you order now, you can get an additional $50 off, which puts the price at $599.99. Okay. okay. I don't know when they're going to add the extra $50 onto that price, but at some point, we're gonna, you're going to be paying an extra $50 for that. So if you want in on this, now would be the time. Tim, we all know Dragon's Lair cabinets go for a lot of money and usually are very hard to keep running because mm -hmm. they're laser disc unless you go with like a Dexter solution or something. So for those of you people who enjoy these Don Bluth laser disc games, this is a really good deal. Six hundred bucks, you get you get basically all three of those games that are very iconic. Tim, I remember going to my favorite arcade back in the day and seeing Dragon's Lair Two mm -hmm. Time Warp and running through that attract mode, and I just thought that was the coolest thing. <laughs> of course, I played it and. That went away. But no, nah, it's not a bad game. It's still a fun game to play as long as you can figure out, as long as you can remember all the directions, right? For sure. So there we go. Uh, I'm and then Tim. At it. What now? I'm horrible at it. You know, I've gotten pretty far in like the emulator, emulate yeah. versions and stuff. I mean, I've, I've done it before, but it is tough. Uh, YouTube Bank says $600. I mean, to me, $600 is a bargain. I mean, right. you, have you seen what, like, a real Dragon's Lair goes for working? <laughs> I mean, it's expensive, you know? So, I mean, you get all three games, 600 bucks, not bad. Uh, Michael says, I've, I really sucked at Dragon's Lair. It takes practice, and um, I've beaten it now, but it took a lot of time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you just have to play. If you play the sections over and over again, you just eventually, you get them memorized. You get them memorized. Right, exactly. Yeah. So, I couldn't do it now. I'd have to work back up. But I have beaten Dragon before. I've seen the end. It's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, same here. It's fun watching other people play. Yeah, it's right. It's more fun watching somebody else. I think play. it is. <laughs> it is, and you and it's one of the games Tim I remember that would have that extra monitor on top, the the little view the mm -hmm. viewing monitor so people could see what was going on, and I think that's why is because you know people people like that. So, um, YouTube Punk says he's a cheapskate. So here's the deal: I bought some arcade one ups because mm -hmm. they were on clearance at uh, at Walmart. I've got I bought the Mortal Kombat one, uh, Midway twelve in one, and I have a. Um, Pac-Man Legacy Edition over here that I bought. This one was 150 on clearance, and the 12-in-1 Midway with Mortal Kombat 2 was 200 on clearance. Nice. So right now, if you've got a Walmart around you, you may want to go check, check and see out. if they've got any of these arcade one-ups on clearance. Uh, the Simpsons, Tim, in some areas was going for 200, but the Simpsons just doesn't have the replayability to me that like um, that like the Mortal Kombat and the Pac-Man have. You know, mm. just I mean, people enjoy those games so much. So if you're a cheapskate and you're looking for a good deal, check your local Walmart for some clearance deals on arcade one-ups right now. 
Uh, let's see. Geek Light says, I only complete Space Ace on my Amiga. I have never completed Space Ace. I find mm -hmm. it harder than Dragon's Lair. Mm -hmm. uh, Dragon's Lair 2 is easier to me. And I think it's because it, uh, if you have the right settings on, Tim, it'll show you which directions you need to hit when. Okay. Which really helps. So, whereas Dragon's Lair, you just had to guess. Right. You know, it's trial and error, so. Um, YouTube Punk says, I remember seeing Dragon's Lair in my local Aladdin's castle. It had a crowd. As a kid, I was thankful for the spectator monitor. Yes, exactly. We've mm -hmm. seen spectator monitors on that game probably more than any other game. Uh, it's just it was because of people wanting to see it. But, Tim, there's not a whole lot of replayability. I mean, if you leave that in an arcade for a while, I think eventually it would stop earning pretty quick. Oh, for sure. Looks great, but, I mean, I think it has a short shelf life, you know. And I get, you know, at the time, though, Laserdisc games were so innovative that people didn't care. But now, you know, it's like one of those things where it's like, Dragon's Lair is a great game, but it's like once you've seen the ending, right. <laughs> you know, that's kind of it. So, anyway. Now, Tim, we had this on our Facebook page, and it's kind of the opposite of what we normally do. Mm -hmm. Normally, we post deals and tell people to buy this, mm -hmm. right? This time, we did the opposite. We said, do not buy this, <laughs> okay? And so, I just want... This got a lot of... Uh, this got a lot of uh, different... Uh, what do you call it? Got a lot of traction, Tim, because people were commenting on it. But normally, we post deals that we recommend you buy. In this case, here's a deal you should not buy. Right. Amazon has a 12-pack of their blue electrical tape for $4.03. Now, Tim, that sounds like an awesome deal. Okay. Sounds like 12 it. packs of electrical tape for $4.03. Great. Yes, this is a good price, but the reviews indicate the adhesive is not good. Tim, we've talked a lot about adhe adhesive tonight. Mm -hmm. This is common on the cheaper brands as they do not... Uh, they do this to save on cost. Remember, don't cheap out on the electrical tape, like Tim says. For real. Get you some high-quality 3M or another name brand instead. You'll thank us later. Right? So, Tim, some things look like a good deal, but they're not. And like I said, we've talked a lot about adhesive tonight. So I'm going to have to talk to all my chemist friends and see about adhesive. But, um, yes, do not buy cheap electrical tape. Don't right. do it. Save yourself the trouble. Now, Tim... I do use cheap electrical tape on things like uh, Christmas light wiring projects. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Like, I, like sometimes um, whenever I put my Christmas lights up, if I have like an exposed plug or something mm -hmm. like that on them, like on the ends, you know how they are in the end. Yeah. I'll wrap it with some cheap electrical tape because I know it's only going to last a month. And and it comes right off easily. <laughs> exactly. So it's one month. But if you're permanently wiring something in your arcade cabinet, don't cheap out on the electrical tape. Right. Okay. Get the good stuff. So just do it. YouTube Punk, like, uh, YouTube Punk was talking fifty cents per play on Dragon's Lair. It's mm -hmm. pricey. Oh yeah, it is price. It was pricey back in the day. Now I take my kids to I take my kids to Round One in Grapevine. You know, over the spring break, mm -hmm. which is awesome. But man, that's expensive. Oh Golly, yeah, golly, man, the credits they they're getting you. So, but uh, you know, again, still have fun though. So it is what it is. The price of games have, has increased dramatically, but here's the thing: the cost of buying games has increased dramatically too. For sure. So I mean, it, it goes both ways. If you can even find them. Exactly. Well, Tim, I think that about wraps it up for our regular show this month. I'm going to okay. always put this out here. Now, you may remember last month, Tim, we played a video in our pre-show lead-up to... Oh, yeah. yeah, in our pre-show lead-up to the live show from Regzer Show. Mm -hmm. If you would like that kind of advertising for your channel, we're always looking for people to submit videos. So, if you have a short 10-minute video or so about an arcade-related topic, you can send a link to your video to questions at arcaderepairtips.com and our staff will review it. If we like it, we'll use it during one of our live show, pre-show to episode kind of things. Make sure that you put a plug in for your channel so people will know where to find you. We look forward to seeing your submissions. And Tim, we always put, I put the, the thing up here. In fact, I'm just going to roll it here so the people who are watching the video version of this can see because I still have it. There it Everyone is. Keeps mm -hmm. talking okay, and we have the little video there and you'll see this was a uh, Rexer show. Thinking. You can probably hear his video. I'm gonna, I'll mute that real quick. But um, yeah, so you can see here, like, I mean, that that's just the pre-show video there that we did for Rexer show. So if you would like to be featured like that on our um, on our channel, please let us know. We'd be happy to do that for you. Just send us in a video, and we'll do something like that if we like it. So if it's arcade-related, it's a great great opportunity for you to get your channel name out there. So for sure. And now I'm getting to the contact information. I'm going to check with the live chat before we do that, Tim. Uh, Michael says, yeah, 50 cents in 1983. That's like $1.25 today for 30 seconds of mm -hmm. pain. <laughs> right. <laughs> Uh, he says, a Tessa tape is the stuff to get. That stuff is amazing. Have you ever used that, Tim? Uh -uh. So, name brand electrical tape. It doesn't have to be 3M. We like 3M, but just get you some name mm. brand. So, anyway. Okay, Tim, let's put the contact information out there real quick, and we're going to go 
get to the after show. So here we go. We have our general email address at questions at arcaderepairtips.com. Questions at arcaderepairtips.com. If you'd like it mentioned on the live show, make sure you put live show in the subject. And we'll try to make sure that we hold it back for the live show. Otherwise, we'll try to answer it whenever we get around to it. And that's, again, questions at arcaderepairtips.com. We have our YouTube page at youtube.arcaderepairtips.com. Of course, uh, everybody who's watching this live knows exactly you know, where it is. But for those of you guys who may be listening on the podcast feed or after the fact, go to youtube.arcaderpairtips.com and you can watch the video of this episode there. Um, And we try to cover the comments from the last live show on the next episode. So if there's any comments that you guys leave on previous live show episodes, we try to cover those on the next one. But again, youtube.arcaderpairtips.com for all of our great videos. And then we have our podcast feed, which features live shows, interviews, question and answer podcast, etc. And you can find that on our iTunes page at itunes.arcaderepairtips.com. And Tim, you can leave us reviews there as well. We'd love for you guys, if you haven't already left us a review on iTunes, please go to iTunes and sign up for an account. Leave us a review. We'd love to, love to get your input there. We have our Spotify page, Tim, at spotify.arcaderepairtips.com. We have our Stitcher radio page at stitcher.arcaderepairtips.com. And of course, Tim, you can find our podcast wherever fine podcasts are aggregated. <laughs> so I like to say it like that. Wherever they do a search for Arcade Repair on your favorite podcast platform, guess what? You'll probably find us. Yeah. So we've been out there long enough at this point that I think we're everywhere, Tim. And we were on Facebook podcast, but they're about to shut down. So don't subscribe there. Find somewhere <laughs> else and you'll be good to go. So, But again, um, iTunes is probably the premier place because we know a lot of you guys use Apple devices. So iTunes.ArcadeRepairTips.com for our iTunes page. And then we have our social media pages, Tim. We have our Facebook page at facebook.arcaderepairtips.com. And uh, we want to thank Mark for all the posts that he made this month, Tim, including the one on the Dragon's Lair that we mentioned. Nice. Uh, Mark is also kind of our pinball reporter, Tim. Any big news in the pinball world, he tends to post up. So uh, we want to thank Mark for all of his contributions to the community and remind you that you can see all of our great posts at facebook.arcaderepairtips.com. Of course, if you don't like Facebook, you'd rather subscribe on Twitter. We have Twitter as well, twitter.arcaderepairtips.com. Tim, I've heard a lot of people are leaving Twitter recently because of a certain purchase. I have no idea what that's about. But if you're one of the people who are still on Twitter, you can go to twitter.arcaderepairtips.com. And, Tim, the same stuff gets posted on both sites. Okay? So it doesn't matter where. If you're following us on Twitter or Facebook or both, same information, either place. You can do that and and find all of our great information. Tim, we posted the deal about the Star Wars Arcade 1-Up pinball machine. and And somebody was so bummed that they missed it. Make sure that you change your notification settings on the Facebook page to get alerted whenever we have a post. And you can do that by clicking the little three little dots up in the corner of the page on the desktop. And then there's a, uh, I think it says, it's like um, notification settings or something mm-hmm. like Turn that. notifications on. And then make us one of your favorites and then say, I want, a, I want a notification every time they post. If you do that, you won't be late next time. I promise. So don't miss out on the deals that we're posting. Make sure that you turn on your notification settings in Facebook. Of course, Twitter yeah. people don't have to worry about that as much. And we should note that we are a privately held company and no chance that Elon Musk will buy us out. Uh, if he comes knocking at the door with enough money, Tim, <laughs> sold. In fact, anybody who wants to come knocking on my door with enough money can have arcade repair tips, okay? Uh, uh, it wouldn't take much. Five digits. That's all, <laughs> that's all I'm asking. So, <laughs> Five digits. This thing's out of here. So um, somebody else can have it, and I'll stay on until my contract expires. So uh, that's how it's going to be. Um, let's see. I, I think that does it for the regular show. Tim, anything okay. to tease for the after show? Uh, we're going to, I'd like to talk about a new game show that I've been watching and, um, uh, a new documentary that I recently watched. Um, what about you? Well, I talked about Sonic the Hedgehog 2. So literally we fill up an entire movie theater with all of my friends for my 40th birthday to watch Sonic the Hedgehog 2. It was pretty full, Tim. So mm-hmm. the entire upper level was full, but we had two rows on the front that weren't. So, okay. um, so like two, there were three rows on the front and two of them were empty. Wow. So we almost filled up the entire movie theater with all my friends. I want to thank everybody who came. It was fun. But I'll tell you what I thought about Sonic the Hedgehog 2. Tim, I got to watch um, Uncharted. Okay. Okay, which uh, Tom Holland got to mm-hmm. watch that. And I got to watch um, The Adam Project on Netflix. Have okay. you seen that with Ryan Reynolds? I have not seen that. So I've watched three movies since we since we've talked last. And I have tickets to go see Doctor Strange next Thursday. Nice. So I am going to go see it. I'm looking forward to that as well. So I um, really want to see Doctor Strange. Big fan. So uh, I'll tell you more about what I thought about that in the next live show. Now, mm-hmm. if you're... At this point, you can get off. The after show happens shortly, about, what, five to ten minutes after the regular live show. Of course, if you're listening to this on the podcast feed, you will need to go to YouTube and look up episode 63 of the live show in order to see the after show. Fast forward past the regular live show part, and then you'll get to the after show if you want to hear more about that. Tim, I do want to talk about Robinhood, which is a platform in the past that we've 
that we've uh, we supported, okay. but we no longer support. We've right. talked about that before, but we'll talk a little bit about Robinhood. Um, Tim, I got a new phone, and I'm not a high end phone user, but this is the first phone I've had in like six years that wasn't an LG phone. I okay. was a pretty, and I was an LG loyalist. Mm-hmm. So I'll talk a little bit about some smartphones too in the after show if you guys are interested in that. Uh, and I think that's going to do it. So if you guys want to stay tuned for the after show, there's some of the topics we'll be covering. If this is your off ramp and you're ready to you're ready to get on with the rest of your night. We want to thank you guys for watching the Arcade Repair Tips live show here tonight. We love answering your questions. We want to thank the live chat and everybody here. Okay, you guys are awesome. Um, something else for the after show, Tim. YouTube Punk says the last episode of Moon Knight dropped on Wednesday. I'm a fan. Oscar Isaac was amazing. We'll talk about Moon Knight because I have also seen all those episodes okay. as well. So uh, if you guys want to hear anything about that, make sure you turn it into the after show. Tim, do you have anything else to say before we exit the regular show and head on into that good night? No, let's go on and just thank you for watching. But continue to keep those questions uh, coming and thank you all for participating in the live chat tonight. Absolutely. Uh, we had a great live chat here tonight. You guys were awesome and amazing. Uh, Tim, we love the questions during the show. It's always fun. And it's fun, too, when we have people who ask questions on the outline that are here. So Joe, for instance, it's really fun when you guys are in the in the live chat with us when we're answering your questions because a lot of times we can get a little bit more back and forth, uh, which makes it a little bit more fun for us as well. Uh, I emailed the people. So if I put your if I put your question on the live show outline, you get an email letting you know that we did that. So that way you can tune in when it's live. I usually send those out either the day before or two days before, depending on when I get the outline done. So uh, if you do submit a question and it's going to be on the live show, we try to get that over there to you so you'll know when to tune in. But Tim, I think that's going to do it for tonight. So if this is your off-ramp, we want to thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, We know you have a lot of options when it comes to your entertainment, so we Mm -hmm. thank you for choosing us and hanging out with us tonight. It's always fun. And uh, just looking forward. Oh, NHL and NBA playoffs. Talking about that too in the after show. Yeah. Okay, I'm done. I think. All right, let's go. Okay. Thank you guys again. And remember here at Arcade Repair Tips, when you fix the game, you play the game. Take care, everybody. We'll see you in the after show or we'll see you next month for episode 64. Take care.
And we're back. Okay. All right. I got the mic on. All yeah, right. mic's on. Okay. So welcome to the after show, guys. Now, as we've talked about, the after show is the show after the regular live show where any topic goes. This is not just arcade topics are welcome here too, but most of the time we talk about medium, movies, music, TV, whatever else whatever. that is on our mind. So, um, Tim, before we get into um, the, some of the stuff that we teased, let's just tell your April go. Did you have a good Easter? Yeah, I had a good Easter. Just everything has just been going 90 to nothing. I told you I just got back from Dallas late and just seems like even after work, I've had stuff to do and to go and it's like we have just went nonstop. But it was a good month. Um, very good Easter. We're just family eating lots of food, the good stuff like that. How about y'all? Yeah, same. I mean, we... Uh, we had the big Easter egg hunt, which Tim mentioned. Right. I made some Easter egg cannons for, um, basically out of out of. Did blowers. the kids really like them? Oh uh, yeah, we got. To, um, there's a great picture of like one of my, uh, of a couple of my friends shooting them off, and and the the guy has this really serious look on his face with this Easter egg coming out of it, and then uh, there uh, one of our friends is behind him, just like looking like this, like she's worried and all this kind of stuff. It was great. <laughs> Funny. Uh, they were shooting them over the kids' heads and stuff. It oh, was okay. crazy. So I mean, <laughs> the kids I, liked it. Yeah, the kids liked it. Liked it. Everybody had to sign a disclaimer form about not getting hurt. So I, mean, I think we're okay. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully, no lawsuits for the church. Right. Um, it was fun to make the the cannons, and then um, I took the biggest cannon that I made and. I took it up to my parents' house, who have a lot of land, Mm -hmm. and I shot one 150 feet. Wow. And like one egg, about 150 feet out of that thing. So, I mean, it could could do pretty well. Easter egg hunt was a lot of fun, though. I really did have a a lot of fun with that. And then, uh, of course, just regular Easter, had family come in, and then... uh, uh, last weekend we did kind of an early Mother's Day with my wife's family. Mm-hmm. So, and then she gets her Mother's Day, of course, on Sunday, and then we'll do my mom's Mother's Day probably the weekend after. So, um, you didn't you doing anything nice for your wife? Um, you, you know, got any plans? we haven't. Like I said, we have been so busy that it's kind of snuck up on me. No, you know, it's like I know she'll be a little sad with Landon being gone. Uh, I'll get with Lacey. Maybe me and her can get together, and maybe we'll just take her out to eat or do something. Or maybe we'll cook something. Mm-hmm. So let her take a day off, maybe. So for the last three Mother's Days, my wife um, has wanted the same thing. And I, we probably started this because of COVID. But uh, La Madeline, which is one mm-hmm. of her favorite places, they offer like this kind of um, family meal for four mm-hmm. that includes like some quiche and some other things. And so I just order that. We just bring it all home after church and we eat it. Oh, nice. So that way I don't have to go to a packed restaurant or anything yeah, like that. That's... We can just eat it. Uh, so, um, you know. Oh, um, YouTube Punk says, was it full auto, Jonathan? Yes, the cannons were. You just keep chunking eggs in there and they just start going. Uh-huh. The problem is you have to pretty much, you have to start it, you have to fill the magazine, start it, let the magazine out and kind of shoot them and then kind of turn it off and reload. Okay. You could probably reload on the fly. I did not try that. Uh-huh. Probably could have, but, you know. So you need to, next year you have to upgrade and have the, the full on automatic. Yeah, or something, exactly. Right? To where I can just keep feeding eggs into it. Or <laughs> if I put like a little funnel on the top yeah. that I can throw <laughs> eggs into, I can probably do it, you know. Uh, but uh, mm-hmm. I have to create like a little uh, one way little drop uh, thing to where when the eggs go through, it, they can't get sucked back up. You yeah. Know, like a little pressure thing. But. <laughs> so always thinking. But anyway, yeah, that was fun. Uh, but yeah, so that's what I'm doing for my wife. So we'll go pick up after we get out of church. I'll go pick that up. We'll bring it home. We'll eat. And uh, she'll get to relax. And I'm, you know, we'll just kind of relax some. You know, hang out. And she'll open her presents and stuff. She knows what I got her. Cool, so, yeah. Nothing big. Uh, let's see. What else? Uh, any investment talk? I didn't want to talk about Robin Hood, but do you have anything you else? You know, not much. Uh, still, everything has been so down. And the other day, I made a little money. I was like, whoa, it, it almost shocked me. I was like, I forget. I haven't even been watching my stocks. I was like, I, one of mine hit a trigger sale that I've had probably for four or five months. All of a sudden, it sold. I'm like, wow. Um... So we've just been kind of playing, playing it uh, safe right now with my investments. Uh, buy, buy more gold, and silver, um, commodities, uh, corn. I'm buying some corn right now because I think that uh, the government released where they're going to allow up to 15% of ethanol now, which is made from corn and gas to try to keep the gas prices lower. So maybe um, that's about it, though. What 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 did you what did you want to talk about, Robinhood? Um, well, I'll talk about stocks real quick. Um, my Dave Buster stock it took a tumble. Well, we thought it was going to go explode. It when did they though. Bought, it yeah, did. So it took a bit. tumble. Then um, now it's back up. Okay, so I'm good. back up on it pretty pretty heavy. So um, so if you would have bought like whenever we were talking about the news with the CEO, it was mm-hmm. kind of, kind of went down there. 
Like uh, I expected it to, and then it's come back up. Sell off or something, huh? You're probably going to see another down and another up because here's the deal. When they announce their next earnings, there's going to be a lot of debt on there, guys. I mean, because mm-hmm. look, they just took on a lot of debt. So you can pretty much guarantee around earnings time that this thing's going to drop like a rock. But then hopefully over the course of the next six, eight, 12 months, mm-hmm. we're going to see an upward trend on it. That's what I'm hoping. So um, after the next earnings would be a great time to buy. That's what I would tell you if you're looking at Dave and Buster's stock. And then hopefully, hopefully it's only up from there. That's what I'm hoping. So about Robinhood. So Robinhood had to lay off a lot of their staff, Tim. I don't know if you saw that. I didn't see And it. yeah, they're, they're losing some money. And Tim, we mentioned in the past that we got away from Robinhood. Mm-hmm. And why was the reason we got away from Robinhood? Well, because they were they messed over a lot of investors with AMs. I with mean, AMC uh, and the in the GameStop. In the GameStop. Exactly. Yeah. And so I no longer trust Robinhood as a trading platform. Me and either. I think a lot of people have now joined us in that. I think we were ahead on that, Tim. Because mm-hmm. pretty much as soon as that happened, I'm like, no. Yeah. I'm never not gonna trade on Robinhood ever again because you guys just trade you guys sold us all out basically. Right. And so look, they get what they deserve. Uh, what they're getting mm-hmm. what they deserve here. They treated the people who use their platform bad okay mm-hmm. they treated them bad in the amc and gamestop debacles and now they to me they've got to win back my trust yeah and it's going to take a while for that to happen if ever i'm very happy with webull yeah i have no problems with webull webull is great there are other free trading platforms that aren't robin hood right that allow people to sell off when they wanted to mm-hmm. where where um and you know webull halted the stock for just a little bit and then allowed people to sell out. Right. But Robinhood just locked it and basically right. didn't let you do anything. And so um, we don't we don't recommend using Robinhood anymore because of that. Webull is now the recommended. You'll see links for our mine and Tim's Webull down below. We still have Robinhood accounts. Mm-hmm. I have not closed my account. I just sold out all my stock or transferred it over to Webull. You can transfer your stock over to Webull. They have a process for that. So if you want to do that, um, you can. I would recommend it. So go ahead and transfer it over to Webull. Mm-hmm. There's Webull has a thing, transfer from another brokerage. Mm-hmm. So use that tool. You can transfer over. A uh, lot of, uh, yeah, let's see. UG Punk, yeah, it sucks that normal people working there get screwed for, over for their management's decisions. And that's exactly that's what happened. Crazy. Exactly. I mean, these people get laid off because Robinhood made dumb decisions on some stuff. Okay. They took their company public. It was private. Even mm-hmm. when we were using it, it was private. It, it IPO'd not that long ago. Right. right. And so, I mean, they're just making, I mean, they made some bad decisions and some bad choices, and now they're feeling the effects of that. That's mm-hmm. what happens. You know, I mean, if you, look, if you screw over your customers, you kind of deserve what you get. True. I'm sorry. I mean, it is what it is. So mm-hmm. Robinhood, you know, they're, they're, you know, they're not making the money. They've lost a lot of active users because of that. But Tim, like you said. We're also not trading a lot right now because the market is volatile as right. all get out. Okay, so we're kind of holding firm on what we've got, mm-hmm. and then just just maybe trying a couple of things here and there just to see. But I mean, you know, it's mm-hmm. you know, it's like right now things are so volatile. Probably not a great idea to be trading in the stock market unless you can have the time to really closely follow it. Right. So that's all I want to say. So that's my whole Robin Hood spell. If you're using Robin Hood and you like it, that's fine. Uh, I'm not gonna. I mean, I would. I would tell you you. Pro- I would tell you to move to Webull or something else. Mm-hmm. But it's your decision. If you're happy with Robin Hood, continue to use Robin Hood. But uh, just know that they did screw over people in the AMC and GameStop sure. stuff. And so there's always a chance they could screw you up. Mm-hmm. That's it. About the markets, my 401k has lost five digits uh, mm-hmm. since January, Tim. Wow. Uh, because I'm in a, I'm in a, you know, a time fund. Mm-hmm. I, I've got all of it into my retirement fund of, you know, retirement of 2050 or 60 or whatever it is. And so, you know, part of me is like, man, I should just manage that a little bit more closely instead of just putting it in the fund. But usually mm-hmm. those funds are pretty good. And I think they'll come back because a lot of times those funds contain really great companies. But right now, a lot Everybody of great companies has, are down. Yeah. <laughs> so it is what it is. So anyway. All the investing, Tim. Let's talk some sports. Uh, you said you want to talk about the Cowboys draft or the draft in general. Yeah. I didn't really follow it at all. I just heard it was mediocre. So what were your thoughts on well, I'm pretty happened? excited about a couple of picks that they picked up. Um, you know, I, I think that um, Michael Parsons uh, came into – it wasn't just um, the way he plays. And he was all – we knew he would – we hoped he would be a good player. Right. It was his attitude. And so they literally chose a couple players that they thought, they said had the Michael Parsons attitude. Mm-hmm. And I like that. They said, we knew there's a lot of talent out there, but they were looking for that 
attitude. So I'm really excited about a couple picks that they got. But you never know. The drafts can be, you get really excited and it can be bust or somebody you never heard of just comes and shine. They got 19 undrafted free agents. I thought there was a lot of, uh, there wasn't a lot of huge names and then there was just a lot of good players. So it kind of float. We'll see some undrafted players probably make the teams on a lot of teams. So, um, you know, I just, I found it interesting. There wasn't a lot of quarterbacks taken in the first round or anything, you know, so it was like, it was just really strange draft. You didn't know a lot of these people they were picking. They're picking, you know, um, but they got a um, nose tackle from Arkansas. I can't think of his name offhand, but man, he is a beast guy. And he is just one of those players that um, really could make an impact. So I'm pretty excited about about the draft. I think we did. I think we did okay. We drafted well, probably the best linebacker. If you didn't hear, uh, he's hurt and probably won't play next year. But kind of one of those deals where the Cowboys took a gamble on him. I hate those. But gambles, when though. but when he mm-hmm. was healthy, he was he was a beast out of LSU. So we'll see. You never know. But um, what what about you? Did you you didn't watch the draft? You just kind of heard. It's hard to get too excited about it these days. Yeah. There weren't a lot of huge, big-name players. That yeah, I, I heard mediocre. Go. I mean, that's yeah. what I like as far as the Cowboys picks go. I did hear Jerry Jones got into a car wreck sometime, somewhere near Deep Bellum yeah. in Dallas, which is you know is a, a rough part of town for right. those of you guys who are in the Dallas area. But um, So I don't know. It sounded like he was okay, but I don't okay. know what he was doing down there. Right. So that would be a different thing. Did he anyway. a driver? <laughs> yeah, I'm sure he did. He already okay. did have had a driver. But anyway... So a couple of things. Let's talk about baseball for a second, Tim. I'm a big Texas Rangers fan. Right. We got off to a very slow start. We're starting Super to streak slow. a little bit, <laughs> which I'm very excited about. So maybe maybe there's hope for us yet. So what's what's pulling us through the streak? Are we hitting or pitching? Pitching. pitching. So okay. our pitching so was terrible. Our pitching is so bad was so bad at the beginning of the season we were last. Mm-hmm. Our pitching has gotten better and we're still last. Okay. That's how bad our pitching was. Okay. Wow. <laughs> so, um, our bullpen has now become a strength. Our guys are starting to perform. Texas Rangers look good. I don't think we're going to make the postseason this year, but mm-hmm. it was never meant for us to do that. The acquisitions that we made, mm-hmm. Corey Seager, Marcus Simeon, were made to last last to the point where our young guys start coming up, mm-hmm. and then maybe we can be competitive. So maybe next year, year after, that's when I'm looking for us to be good. Okay, because again, we're in we're in this rebuilding phase still. So we're getting close to the end of the rebuilding, but we're not there yet. So still rebuilding. Any surprises from the other teams or playing better than you thought or not playing very good? Um, I don't know if there's anybody in particular that's really that's really a surprise. Yankees are good. Mm-hmm. Um, Blue Jays are good. Kind of knew that. Astros, I thought would be better. The Angels are in first place in our division, which is mm-hmm. crazy because I don't feel like they're they're gonna hold that very long. I mean, look, Shohei, Shohei Otani. And Mike Trout, two names that are mm-hmm. two of the best guys in baseball by far. But I don't know. It's like all the rest of the pieces around them have never been that great. Their pitching is doing really well right now. We'll see if that sustains. Seattle is better than I thought they would be. Um, you know, I look at our division, Tim, and pretty much nobody else. Um, you know, the Padres are very exciting to watch. If you haven't seen the Padres, the Atlanta Braves are always... I mean, Atlanta won the World Series last year. Mm-hmm. They, they, they let Freddie Freeman go, which was kind of a surprise, but they still have a good team. There's a lot of good baseball happening right now. So okay. if you like baseball, you should be watching. There's a lot of good everything happening. Oh, Michael, Bl- Michael, I'm sorry. He's an Orioles fan. The Orioles are terrible. Right. I'm sorry. And <laughs> it's all our fault as a Texas Rangers fan. We it's all, all of our, our fault. Players. No, um, who was the guy from Longview that they had the, the long, huge contract on for the long? Chris Davis. Chris Davis, yeah. Okay, Sorry. Look, we didn't sign him to a long-term contract. I love Chris Davis, okay? But he had that one big year, and you guys paid him like a billion bucks or something like that, mm-hmm. and all of a sudden, that that, that pretty much tanked. Like, he, you're still paying him. Right. Um, I think they've worked out some deals on that. I love Chris Davis. I'm sorry he performed the way he did. I wish he would have performed the way he did on his big contract year that he had. Mm-hmm. But that's really one of the things that really sunk you. So, mm-hmm. and now you're rebuilding. Rugnet Odor's over in, or- in Orioles now. But yeah, I don't know when they're going to have a good team again. Like, I don't know what their rebuilding plan is. If you're getting our old players, you're not doing too good. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so, not a good sign. Um, yeah, so rebuilding for 25 years. Yeah. And <laughs> Michael, he was worthless. He was good for one year. It's just the fact that you paid him based on the one year. Right. You know, like, like let's say I predict stocks and I make a million dollars in one year. And you're like, hey, I'm going to invest $5 million with that guy and then I lose it all. Right. That's the same thing that happened with Chris Davis, basically. So it happens. You know, I mean, who, know, who, who knew he was going to go from 
great to bad like instantly. I mean, <laughs> I couldn't have predicted it. But again, um, he was decent when he was with us. Right. And I thought that they should pay him, but not as much as what the right. Orioles gave him. So, sorry. Sorry about Chris Davis. Sorry. So, uh, Chris Davis did set the MLB batting average record. Yeah, lowest ever probably or something right. like that. So, anyway. <laughs> I like Chris Davis. He, he's literally from like 45 minutes up the road. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I always liked him as a player. Didn't think he deserved the money. But look, he performed. You can't say he didn't perform the one year when they gave him the big paycheck. So there you go. Okay. Uh, you've been watching basketball or football? Or basketball or hockey at all? Mostly basketball. So both of the mm-hmm. Texas teams that we follow are in the playoffs. Right. The Mavericks are in the playoffs. They made it past the first round with right. the Utah Jazz. Okay, which was great. Which they looked really evenly matched. That was a good series. Until Luka came in. Right. They did. Then when Luka came in. Yeah, that was obvious that they were going to win the series. But now they're playing the Phoenix Suns. A little different Number story. one seed, Phoenix Suns. Tim, you should see. So Luka, Luka Doncic, if you guys have not seen this kid play and you like basketball at all, you should watch a Mavericks game. He is amazing. Mm-hmm. He is better than amazing. Right? He's He's fantastic. The problem is he can't do it all by himself, and he's not a good defender. Mm-hmm. And so literally, if you've been watching either of the two games, the Phoenix Suns set up their defense to get the match with him because they know he's not a good defender. Mm-hmm. So you'll see them pick and roll over until, until whoever has the ball is being guarded mm-hmm. by Don, uh, Doncic, and then they will, they will aggressively go after him. Hmm. And it's amazing. And they're scoring like that a lot. And so, and so he needs to pick up his defense a little bit, okay? If he's gonna, if we're gonna do this, but everybody else needs to shoot better too. It's a combination of things. Okay, look, Luca can't do it by himself, guys, and he's scoring forty points a game, Tim. But that's Phoenix, by yourself, right? But Phoenix looks awesome yes. all the way around. Phoenix is exploiting everything. They're exploiting us on the defensive side of the ball. They're exploiting us on the offensive side of the ball. They're really good. I, mean, I can't say enough about them. They got good players. Uh, they're awesome. So how are they're the, the number one seed. How are the Stars doing then? So the Stars in the first round of the playoffs have the Calgary Flames. I have a lot of family in Canada, in Calgary specifically, mm-hmm. so this is kind of personal for me. If any of my, of my Canadian family is watching, uh, we're going to beat you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, <laughs> but um, look, the Dallas Stars in the Flames. Better are, look next year, eh? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we are very evenly matched. They have they have a front line that's very comparable to ours. And mm-hmm. so it's very... And look... The first period of the first game, there was a fight between mm. two guys, between two guys, and then a fight between two more guys. I mean, this is very personal on very on many levels. Um, the Flames are very aggressive, mm-hmm. more aggressive than we are, and so it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. They won the first game, one nothing. Second game is tonight, so um, it's going to be a good ser- series for those of you people who watch playoff hockey. And Tim, watch playoff hockey. Okay. I don't care if you're I don't care if you're a hockey fan. Just watch watch playoff hockey. Playoff hockey is fast and furious and way different than regular season hockey. You should watch it just because it's fun. NBA is the same way. Like, I'll watch NBA games during the regular season, but playoffs are more fun. They are. So, I mean, if you got nothing to watch and you're at all interested in any of these sports, watch a hockey game, watch a basketball game. They're fun to watch. They're on ESPN, TNT, TBS. They're all on their major cable channels. So if you have a major cable package, watch these games. You won't regret it. Good well, you stuff. could actually watch professional football right now if you wanted to. Yes, you could. The USFL, which I don't think anybody is. Tim. <laughs> I don't, I'm wondering that, too. I heard Birmingham is winning, but, you know, they play all the games in Birmingham. So, right. I mean, it, it is what it is. With that said, we did hear that the coaches have been announced for the XFL. Right. And that Bob Stoops it's is, again, going to be a coach on uh, of an XFL team. Hopefully the Dallas team again. Uh, Tim, we had such a good... That was the last was sporting event, event we went to before COVID. And we had fun. Yeah. And good. it was fun. And the tickets were cheap. I want to go back to an XFL game. Me too. I'll go again. So um, I had fun. And I, I I, don't... You know, I mean, it was it was a great experience. You got to meet... Um, you got to meet a former Cowboy player, right? Yeah. I forget who you got, oh, man, got to I'm meet. Oh, man. I'm trying to think um, of it too. But the stadium was set up well for that. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, and the game was fun. You could take a, a family Russell, of... Maryland? I think so. I think so, yeah. Uh, you could take a family of four and not break the bank to a professional football game. And the football was decent. Look, it's not NFL quality. Right. But it's decent enough. And you could tell the schemes. Like, I mean, they're still scheming like it's NFL. You know, it didn't look... It looked better in the college game, but not on the level of the NFL. Right. Me. So, whereas the USFL looks bad. Right. I don't... Yeah. I don't I, to me, I don't know. I've, I've watched like one or two games, and I just feel like 
I feel like I feel like quality football. When I really think cool. of USFL, I think of Marcus Dupree, and so that made me watch the 2020 on him. If you've never watched it, <laughs> that's the right. The best that ever. That never oh, that's was. a great 30 for 30. Yes. Yeah, that's what I mean. That's a 2020 20, 20, mm-hmm. 30 for 30. That is a great uh, documentary. And when I think about the USFL, I think about him. And so it made me want to watch that, and that's kind of where I went with it. Gotcha. <laughs> and so I didn't watch the USFL game. I started watching the uh, 30 for 30, and that is a, was a really good one. That is a really Very good one. Very interesting. If you're watching the USFL, let me know right now. Right. I have a feeling none of you are. Right. So, in fact, if you're watching this, let me know right now. <laughs> so there we go. But, um, but probably about the same audience viewers. Yeah, right? exactly. Michael says, I love going to minor league hockey games. Those guys play hard. They really do, and the lights are off. Are the fights are often uh, vicious? Yeah, mm-hmm. hockey is fun to watch. Yeah, it, to me, hockey is the most entertaining sport because it's fast. There's no and and here's the thing, I love basketball, but the officials ruin basketball. Mm-hmm. You heard me, it's true. The officials will call these things and like one, two identical plays will look exactly identical and they'll call one, they won't call mm-hmm. the other. It drives me nuts. Hockey, hockey refs are just like unless it's blatant. Right. We're letting it go. Right. And I love that. that they could, just play. Right. Like, it, you know, you know, it's like, however long the period is, 15-minute period, 15 minutes. I still haven't figured out what's illegal. Okay. Like, <laughs> you want me to you want to do a little bit of hockey education? I don't want to okay. get too much off of this. Okay. So, obviously, they have, like, um, they have an icing call where mm-hmm. it's like if you hit the puck to the other side, um, the other side of the, the rink and there's not a, there's not a, uh, there's not a, a defensive player over there or right. an offensive player over there, then you get like, kind of like an icing offsides type call. Um, tripping people with your stick is obviously illegal. High sticks are illegal. Okay. You know, um, uh, so I mean, those kind of things. So like, you, you're not supposed right. to, you're supposed to, you got to take care of your stick. So you can't be tripping people up. Okay. It, okay. You can't put it in between a guy's legs. You can't trip people but up But you can punch it. him. No, you get, well. You can punch him, but here's the thing: you mm-hmm. can start a fight, but once a fight starts, nobody else can really join you. That fight has to kind of finish. Okay. <laughs> okay. So I mean, it is what it is. Um, and here's the thing: you still get penalized for that. Okay. You know, I mean, so I mean, it's not like you don't. But um, hockey games are fun to watch. I mean, they're just fun because mm-hmm. they're fast, and there's always something happening, and the refs can't ruin it. It's one of the few sports where I feel like the refs can't ruin it. Right. Um, you know, because I mean, you get how you don't, you don't have you're... a lot of controversial calls. Right. Like... Exactly. Yeah. I mean, when was the last time you heard of a bad hockey call? Right. Okay. Yeah, you hear bad basketball calls, sure. bad football calls, bad baseball calls. But when was the last time you heard a bad hockey call? Man, that right. was not an offsides, or that was not a tripping, or whatever it is. Right. It just doesn't happen very often. So, sh- shout out to all of the hockey refs out there. You guys, champions. So, mm-hmm. and you don't know any like hockey ref names, right? Like there's certain there's certain like NFL umps or um, right. or baseball umpires or stuff. You know their name, or or or, or NBA guys, mm-hmm. even NBA guys. Like you know their name because they call the same fouls all the time. Mm-hmm. Whatever. So, again, hockey is fun. You should watch it. Okay, now let's go ahead and transition into our movie and our movie and uh, TV show time real quick and just say that you start watching one of the shows I recommended on the last episode. Oh, okay. And yeah. that is Winning Time. Yes. Which is the, the rise of the, the Showtime Los Angeles Lakers. Right. And this is on HBO Max. So, I said it was awesome. What did oh, you think it, of it? It is, that's probably one of the best shows I've seen in a long time. Thank you. And uh, this, we talked about this earlier. It's just amazing. How did you get a guy that looked so much like and could act just like Magic Johnson and be tall and everything? And then a Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. And every character is just so... Even Pat Riley and everybody that's on there is just like, oh my gosh. It's the best um, casting job I think I've ever seen in anything. And so it's very interesting. And a lot of the story you knew, but um, it's also, um, you know, growing up, I remember Magic versus Bird and stuff. And so I've kind of sidetracked and watched a lot more documentaries about. And you really, you know, growing up, I, as a love and playing basketball and everything, I just thought Larry Bird was the greatest oh, ever. Me too. But you, I never really. He it, was an a hole. Yeah, he was. <laughs> I, mean, a, I don't want to be. <laughs> that's a. That's where I was going you know, with and this. I, and I should have known that he that. was a jerk. Right, I should have known that because but, it's like, you see that, that he had such an intense face. But it was purpose, purposeful. Right. He he really wasn't. Right. But he was. He wanted to convey that. Yeah, he wanted to convey that, and how him and Magic Johnson really became friends. Uh, and you know when, uh, like you know. I think Larry Bird said something like he only cried a couple times in his life, like the day his dad died and the day he found out Magic Johnson had AIDS or something. Mm-hmm. It's like, 
wow, you know, he's like, it really hit me. You know, he's like, wow, you know, he thought he was going to die. Mm -hmm. And so um, just I think that uh, just a different time and era in how they say basketball and how even today I, I miss that style of basketball where it was was about the team and about the pass. That right. Magic Johnson and Larry Bird both could make these unbelievable passes and um, a lot of times people couldn't even, didn't know it was coming, couldn't handle the passes. They were so good. Uh, so I missed some of that in today's ball. But, uh, but yeah, definitely a must watch if you've got those platforms and can watch it. That's HBO Max, and that's winning time. It's got John C. Riley as Jerry Buss. Yeah, it's also got Sally Field as his mom. Yeah. So it's got some really great actors in there, too. Um, uh, it's got the guy from uh, How I Met Your Mother. I can't think of his name at the moment. He plays the coach that comes after Jack. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, Westmore, something yeah. like that. Um, so, I mean, it's got some really great casting. Tim Paul, is right. Paul Westfall? Yeah, that's it, the real yeah. guy's name. Yeah. But I forget, uh, Jason something. Okay. Uh, is but... Jason Siegel? Mm -hmm. Jason something like that. But, um, yeah, that's really good. So mm -hmm. if you haven't seen Winning Time on HBO, the finale's coming up this week. And so it's only 10 episodes. You can fire through it really quick. But even if you don't like basketball, super entertaining. Love the time period. Love the way that they produced it. Like it took like with the same kind of seventies look mm -hmm. that like film of that time had. And, and that they did it like a documentary and right. stuff. You know, it's like remember the they were uh, at one point they were talking about. Uh, you know, this was really a little time thing. Right. And they didn't have budgets for stuff. And they were trying to get cheerleaders and all that. And one of the guys was like, we need to come up with a better idea to do this. And it says at the bottom of the screen, now as a billionaire, you know, right now. It's like <laughs> funny, the little things in the background, even some of the people. And, and how Pat Riley became the coach is crazy. Yep. I never knew it. I just thought, yeah, you know, they hired him. He was a coach. He literally went from nothing to a coach. Yep. And that's just Which awesome. we haven't seen that all the way through yet. Right. But we will. But we know it's happening. We know it's We know coming. it's going to happen. Right, exactly. Yeah. So, um... Let me switch gears real quick and just, I did tease my phone. So, um, I've had an LG phone forever, too. Like, mm. I, I, the, the, um, I had a G2, I think an LG G2. Okay. Okay. And then all the way up to an LG Velvet, which I had to send in for repair. Okay. LG has stopped making smartphones, so I have gone to this mid-level Samsung A52 phone. Okay. Which, there's an A53 now. But the A52 still has a headphone jack on it. Okay. I'm very old school. I like my headphone jacks and my SD cards. Okay. <laughs> but, um, you know, I was never a big Samsung fan. But uh, this phone is growing on me. I Did like you it. ever own an Apple? Oh, yeah. I no, had an original iPhone. You had one, I had you? an original iPhone and I had a 3GS. Okay. So, um, and then after that, I went to Windows Phone, believe it mm -hmm. or not, for a I while. I remember that. I had several Nokia phones. And then I went to the LG, and then I went to an HTC One. Right. And then I went to the LG T G2. So I mean I've 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 gone when the original iPhone came out I went from a flip Nokia to the original Apple. Wow. So I paid four hundred dollars for my original iPhone. <laughs> uh, it was refurbished. It, the iPhone had been out about eight months when I got mine. So I got it. I got it almost when it came out eight wow. months and before a lot of people had iPhones. Right. And before the iPhone had an app store. That's how long ago. Wow. Okay. Um, and then and then I got a 3GS and then I went to the Windows phone for a while and then I ended up on Android. I've been on Android forever, it feels like. <clears throat> but um, but I'm liking I'm liking the Samsung. Um, I figured out that I don't need like the fastest, latest and greatest flagship phone. I can get by with a mid tier as long as it's got the SD card, Tim, which is mm. something that's a have to for me because I like the extra space. And I like headphone jacks. So um, people who make I who make phones, headphone jacks. We still like them. Right. So, I agree. But um, I'm happy with my Samsung, and uh, I, you know, I I didn't pay much for it, and it's doing everything that I want. And so, um, as an LG guy for a long time, RIP LG smartphones. So they they made good phones, way better phones than people gave them credit for. So what I'm really interested in hearing about though is when you went to see Sonic. How did that? Can oh, we get into okay, that we're now? going back now. Can okay, go back? back to movies and TV shows. Um, before I I comment, Michael did say we started rewatching Justified. It's on Hulu. The chief art played Nick Cersei reminds me so much of you, Tim. Same features and even the same voice. Uh oh, he's a country hick from Texas. I guess. <laughs> you need to watch Justified. I, I think to verify so. this. So I'm curious now. Uh, let's see. Um, YouTube Punk says, wife and I were looking at the V60. I'm still rocking a Note 9 with a headphone jack. So the V60 is a fantastic phone. 
I have an LG Velvet and the camera stopped focusing and I still have a warranty on it. So I sent it in for repair. The V60 is a good phone. The LG Velvet's a good phone. Both of them are still good phones. LG will continue to support their phones, I think, for two more years. Wow. And so you can continue to buy LG phones with that in mind, but it won't be long until they're gone. The A53, the Samsung A53, doesn't have the headphone jack, but does have an SD card slot, is on sale right now from Best Buy for, I think, $349, $350. Okay. No contract or anything. $350 straight out, which is a really good price for that. So if you're looking for something similar, you may look at the A53. So there you go. Samsung. Okay. Sonic the Hedgehog. Fun. Great. Mm-hmm. So much fun. Golly. And it was fun being in a being in a theater, which is like everybody. Right. And guess what? We let the kids run around during the movie. Yeah. <laughs> because we had the theater. It was awesome. So, I mean, I had a great birthday there. Um, it was just fun. Like I said, it was fun being in a room with everybody. I'm sorry you couldn't make it. Yeah. Do your family stuff. I mean, kind of a bummer because we still had some extra seats in there. We could have got some more people in. But um, we had a great time. The theater was super nice. All the people who helped out with it and coordinated everything were great. I can't say enough. We had a studio movie girl, Tim, mm. which is a movie theater here in town. They're, they're all over Texas. Right. Uh, but um, it's one of those ones where you eat and you um, you can eat while you watch the movie. Mm-hmm. So I had I had a pizza and some food and some popcorn and other things. And it was fun. And it's had a great time. So, um, But Sonic was good. Jim mm-hmm. Carrey as Robotnik. Mm-hmm. Supreme casting. Golly, that guy does it so well. And I hope he comes back for Sonic the Hedgehog 3. He doesn't have to do anything else acting-wise ever, (laughs) except for Sonic the Hedgehog 3. (laughs) Please come back, Jim, please. Because, I mean, it's really good. For a kid's movie, guys, super entertaining. We had so much fun. Um, Look, you know, they send, they kind of take Sonic's human friends and they kind of put them in this kind of side story Mm -hmm. and they end up merging back together. But, you know, that was kind of convoluted, but it worked, in my opinion. Still fun. And Mm -hmm. they had a teaser at the end for the next Sonic movie. So I think, I told my wife when Sonic 3 comes out, we're going to do the same thing again. I don't even care if it's my birthday. (laughs) There you go. I'm just going to do it. So, anyway. So, good stuff. um, But I highly highly recommend watching Sonic 2 if you haven't seen it. Uh, And it's going to be coming out on Paramount Plus here at the end of May. If you okay. want to see it. So I have a Paramount Plus subscription. I don't know if you do, Tim. But if yes, you do, do, if you do, then one month from now, or 24th or something like that, you can watch it. So here in about 20 days, you can watch Sonic the Hedgehog 2 on there. Well, you said you watched some other movies, too. Also, uh, though, but I saw Uncharted. Okay. Okay, so you can buy that one right now. I think it's $20 or whatever. It's got Tom Holland in it. Mm-hmm. Um, very good. Enjoyed it. It's a video game movie, Tim. Based okay. on the Uncharted series, Sony, you know, Sony does. And... If you like Indiana Jones or uh, what's the one with Nicolas Cage where they're going after the Constitution? National oh, Treasure. Uh, yeah. If you like those movies, guess what? You'll like it. It's this movie. Okay. <laughs> I will say that there is one cool stunt, and I don't want to ruin it for anybody, but there's one cool stunt in, involving an airplane and some cargo. That is <laughs> that is awesome. Um, like just the way they, they choreographed it, shot it. Fantastic. But it's only on demand right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. It'll be available for rent, I think, pretty soon. It may be now. I don't know. And then the other movie I watched was The Atom Project, which has Ryan Reynolds in it. That's what I'm interested in. And, it, and it's very good. I, okay. It's a time-traveling movie. Okay. So um, I don't want to ruin too much about it, but it's good. I mean, you should watch it. The Atom Project, I, I watched it. It was different than what I thought it would be. But it is a time-traveling movie, and it has uh, Mark Ruffalo in it, Tim. Jennifer Garner's in it. Okay. Um, so a lot of people that you would recognize if you watched it. Okay. So, um, I remember that. Fun stuff. I so watch it. It, it was good. Watch yeah, the list. Adam Project, A D A M. So, um, let's see. A uh, YouTube punk says, "Will those venues let you bring in your own movies, or uh, for when you rent out a theater?" I don't know. I don't think so. I think you pretty much have to do whatever they're showing at the time. Yeah. So um, during COVID, the they relaxed a lot of the rules on that, but I think now you have to. You basically have to see whatever you whatever they're showing. Probably. So. Um, Let's see. I, we watched Hawkeye on Disney+. Plus. Um, it came out in December, but me and my wife had not got around to it. But we both loved it. It was better than I thought. So hats off to Hawkeye. If you haven't watched it on Disney+, Plus, give it another watch. Or okay. give it a watch. Um, I thought it was going to be just kind of rote and very by the book. But it ended up being better than I thought. And I knew that there. I knew the one reveal that was in it because I'd already been spoiled by that. And I don't want to spoil it for y'all if you've seen it. But um, as a... As a big fan of the Netflix Marvel show, seeing the big cameo was awesome too. So um, watch Hawkeye if you have Disney Plus. Um, who I think YouTube Puck mentioned Moon Knight. Okay, Moon Knight was good, and the finale was great. And Oscar Isaac, fantastic acting. Acting. 
that's the best thing you can say about the entire show is that his acting performance he has to play different characters okay that are him because he's kind of schizophrenic okay and the way he plays those characters is fantastic okay. you can tell when he's playing one and playing the other even though it's the same guy fantastic so moon knight was really good um and then the invisible pilot tim i told you about this one do you watch it i haven't seen it yet the Invisible Pilot on HBO Max is a documentary about a guy who fakes his own death and then goes on a, kind of an excursion and ends up ends up testifying before Congress. We'll just put it like that. Wow. Okay. I'm not going to tell you what happens in between. You should just watch it. The very first episode is him is him faking his own death. Okay. So <laughs> and then the rest of it is him uh, getting to a point where he him. where he testifies in front of Congress. It's amazing. So The Invisible Pilot on HBO Max. It's a documentary. It's three episodes. So you should watch that. We're watching I'm um, some of these. Okay, mm. yeah. So um, we're watching we're watching something else. Uh, the flight attendant on HBO Max season okay. two. Watching that. that. Uh, let's see. And I think that's we're about to start watching the staircase with oh. Colin Firth. Okay, which comes on HBO Max on the fifteenth, I think. So um, Michael Bloom says Beavis and Butthead are coming back this year on Paramount Plus. I'll subscribe when that happens. The drawings gave. Uh, Gave them in their 40s, so that should be hilarious. <laughs> that <laughs> um, would be funny. Paramount Plus runs free month offers all the time, guys. So if you just want to sign up for like a month to watch the stuff that you want to watch on Paramount Plus, um, do a search for like a free month and you'll probably find a code for it. Even if you've already had a free month, you can find another free month code. So um, uh, it's a good it's a good service. Um, there's a lot of good shows on Paramount Plus. Looking forward to when Sonic Hedgehog 2 comes out on Paramount Plus. So um, there you go. Now, Tim, um, the last thing I think we had here on the outline was that you watched a documentary I started watching called Dream Killer. Yes. Now, before it, this is on Netflix, and before you get into that, you've got to watch this before May 31st because it's about to leave Netflix. Okay. I saw that. Okay, so if you're, in this is out, something, huh? if you want to see it, it came out in 2015, I think is what it said, mm. and watch it before May 31st. But Tim, give us the rundown. I watched the first 10 minutes, but I don't know everything. Yeah, so. basically, it's a. Um, a crime documentary where a guy is brutally murdered and a couple years later a guy confesses to it uh he's the, the police have him he he comes to the police and says i want to tell you what we did and we murdered this guy and um when they go to interview the other guy he said he did it with he's like what are you talking about we didn't murder anybody that's crazy i i'm not a murderer and so based on this guy's testimony they are going to convict him. It's this is not a giveaway. So the whole story is then the dad turns into kind of his own detective and tries to win his son's freedom. And that's really what it boils down to. It's just how a dad kind of becomes an average dad, real estate agent, turns into super sleuth, and how he learns how to be a detective, how he learns how to do be, basically be a lawyer and uh the outcome and stuff so you watch that it's very good okay i watched i started watching the first like 10 minutes and it was very fascinating but i was i started watching you texted it to me at like eight o'clock yeah. or something like that and I, I started would, watching I just it like after watching it i was like oh my gosh i would love this and i knew we'd probably talk about it tonight so so i fell asleep during it i'm sorry that's all right um, it gets really good it i am also halfway through. i am also watching the way down on hbo max yes so have you now they just came out with the they second half. Out, oh, we gotta watch it. So watch the second half. Um, we've been waiting for it to come out. I the way it down out. is about uh, this church, pa this pastor lady who runs this church mm -hmm. in Tennessee, and how it's basically a cult. Mm -hmm. But she died going to a Trump, trying to go to a Trump rally on her private plane, and basically now it's about the fallout from that. Okay. Okay. So um, it's very interesting if you like cult documentaries, which I'm. If you guys have listened to me, you know I'm a huge a huge fan of. So um, that's good. I want to watch the Abercrombie and Fitch documentary yes. on Netflix. That's, that's on, my on my list. That's probably on my list. Um, because I've heard that basically it comes down to Abercrombie and Fitch was kind of a racist company. Mm -hmm. And if you think about their models and the way that things were done there. Maybe so. Kind of seems like that might have been it. I don't uh -huh. know. So I haven't watched the documentary to know that for sure. I just heard what people have said about it. And that's kind of what people have said. So now, now they've kind of changed their stance. We should say that Abercrombie and Fitch has now got more uh, diversif uh, diversification of models and things. But mm -hmm. you remember, used to be the guy with like the abs and the flat chest right. and shirt off and pants or whatever. That used to be like the only person they would hire. Basically. Right. <laughs> so, um, but uh, yeah. So I mean, basically, that's part of the documentary. Really fascinating that because um, 
Tim, I know it was probably a little outside of your age range. You right. may remember going by an Abercrombie and Fitch, mm-hmm. but right. like when I, I was growing up, yeah, mm-hmm. I was about to say when I was growing up, kids wore it, and right. it, you know, and they thought it was cool and everything like that. So I uh, do want to watch that one as well. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's everything. I can't think of anything else that uh, you know that that's on my list. A lot of great shows coming out. HBO yeah. Max has a lot of stuff right now. Mm-hmm. If, if you're really interested in watching some stuff, sign up for a month of HBO Max and get to work. Cause I mean, there's a lot of stuff. Winning time wraps up this week and I can't wait to see the finale episode. It's going to be great. Um, golly, so many great shows and Moon Knight, of course, really looking forward to seeing Dr. Strange already have my tickets for next Thursday wow. after work, going with a friend, ready to go see it. I'm a huge Doctor Strange fan. I watched uh, Spider-Man No Way Home. Have you seen that yet, Tim? Mm-hmm. Okay. So, what'd you think? Oh, it was, I liked it. Yeah, it was really good. good. It was good. And I like how Doctor Strange kind of integrated into all of that. And it looks like um, Multiverse of Madness, you know, kind of has a horror feel to it, I've heard. So, mm-hmm. I'm interested in that. Some jump scares, Tim. Okay. So, we should do jump scares on, on the live show. <laughs> right? yeah. I might need one to wake me up now. There you go. Well, I think we'll leave it there. Um, if you guys end up watching anything, here's the thing. You can always send anything to questions at arcaderepairtips.com. If you just want to send us an email about all the shows you're watching, that's fine too. Um, because we like, I just like watching shows and keeping up with stuff. You know, I mean, I think that that's really fun. So, um, if you're watching any of these shows, tell us what you think. If you're watching something interesting, send it to questions at arcaderepairtips.com. We'd love to hear what you're watching. Uh, let's see. Um, I did buy the arcade one ups, which I have here. I showed the, um, the Midway one, Tim, is really cool. It has 12 games on it. Right. And one of the games is Wizard of War, which, which I was playing. Yeah. We love Wizard of War. That one's great. Um, Root Beer Tapper, yeah. which is another one that, you know, really hard to find, really enjoy. And so that, that cabinet is really fun. Mm-hmm. I mean, I was surprised. And then I got the I got the. Pac-Man it's interesting right that you'd have Wizard of War and Tapper on a Metal, Mortal Kombat game. Right, and Joust. Right, and Joust. So. And Defenders on there, too, I think. So, in Tubin. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of great games on that thing. So, I mean, I, I you know... A lot of people are down on Arcade 1-Up. I think YouTube Punk said, get your mom an Arcade 1-Up. Hey, if she mm-hmm. likes Pac-Man. But uh-huh. um, actually, you can get your mom. Uh, we have a cocktail for sale. So if you, <laughs> if you want to give right. your mom that uh, for Mother's Day, we'd be happy to sell that to you for a good price. We'll cut you a deal. If you're if you're a viewer, we'll cut you a deal. But yeah. um, no, I mean, I think uh, I think these Arcade 1-Ups uh, just, I mean, it just shows you there's a demand for them. I think, you know, Tim, we did a, one of our first arcade debates was whether or not these things would sell. Well, I think they've pretty much proven that they have. Mm-hmm. So, and there's a market for these. And you should see all of the, um, you should see all the game rooms people have with just Arcade 1-Up cabinets. Yeah. I mean, it's cool, and, and like There's when people have those game, out when they have those game rooms, they are like, I never thought I'd have an arcade in my own house. I would say, well, you you know, it's arcade one up cabinets, but it is an arcade technically. Right. I mean, it, look, it's not like the arcade I have in my house. And I turned the factory. <laughs> yeah, exa- yeah, and you got to go to the little place where they made them. But anyway, um, so don't be down on these people about the arcade one ups. And if you can get them on clearance, get them on clearance. I mean, yeah. golly, it's cheap 200 150 bucks for this guy over here. Uh, I mean, it just seems like a good price for what you're getting, Tim. I think so. Okay. Anything else, Tim? No, I'm ready to go. I got a. Er- I'm already been sent on an errand. Okay, well you go <laughs> run your errand, and we'll be back next month, Tim. Golly, is that June? Yep. What are we doing in June? June second. Okay. June second. Second of June. Uh, it'll be the next live show, and that's something's coming. I should up. announce, John. You don't know this. Oh. Uh, June, I'm getting hit with a surprise. Well, yeah. Um, I will be in Upper State, New York, the last week of. May, so if you're in the Rochester, Syracuse area... Is that the 23rd through the 27th? Uh, 23rd through the 27th. Okay. I will be in Rochester and Syracuse, New York for work. And uh, if you're in that area and you know some good arcades or you just want to meet up or something, let me know. Well, I'll be up in that Well, area. you should definitely go to some arcades while I'm you're there. Try. There's a ton of them there. I'm sure there are. So you just need to find the right ones. But anyway, take care, guys. Have a good month. Again, questions at ArcadeRepairTips.com for anything that you want to send us. We'd be happy to, to look that over. And uh, we hope that you have a great month and enjoy it with your family and friends. And uh, we look forward to seeing you back here next month for the next live show. Until then, guys, take care. Be safe. Have a great one. Stay healthy. All that good stuff. And we'll see you then. Goodbye, everybody. Night. And i got to hit the right button to make us go away. <laughs> Is this one it? Yep, there that's it.